Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. Uh, my name is Mary Ann. I'm calling from CCG's marketing team. Um, today, we have a really great lineup of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Rustin Kennington from uh, Corsicana Mattress, Lee Crump from Rollins, Kevin Davis from K-Force, and Dwayne Wilcox, Wilcox um, from TKE. I'm, I'm not even going to try to uh, pronounce that. Was it the Thyssen Crop Elevator? <laughs> Um, today is going to be uh, a really exciting lineup of uh, speakers. We're going to kick off the meeting with a panelist, uh, a panel, sorry, um, hosted by John Bastone. Um, we also have on the line Dan Rodriguez uh, from CCG and uh, Brian Rimes from CCG. Uh, following the panel discussion, we'll dive into a um, individual presentations with Chris Fitzpatrick from Vineyard Vines and Chris Leaping from Bagel Brands. And with that, um, Danra, do you wanna add anything? No, I think we're, um, you know, it might be good for the audience to uh, kind of go around the room and, and have the panelists and the speakers that are already on just kind of give a, a one minute intro into uh, your role with your organization um, just for familiarity's sake. So why don't I go ahead, Rusty, why don't you go ahead and, and kick us off? Sure. sure, Rusty Kennington. I'm with uh, Course Canna Mattress. Uh, I was brought in as their CIO about three years ago uh, with the mission to really uh, transform the company from a technology standpoint, uh, the private equity owned. And so uh, uh, we really had, uh, it was good fortune that, that we had the entire executive team lined up to allow us to do what we've been doing. Fantastic. Um, thanks, Rusty. Thanks for joining. And uh, Lee, you want to go ahead next? Yeah, my name is Lee Crump. I'm the uh, CIO and Group Vice President at Rollins, Inc. Rollins is a uh, $2 billion a year holding company of pest control companies. And our largest brand and, and the most well-known uh, is Orkin. Uh, but then we've also got uh, other regional brands around the country, some of the ones that people might have heard of, Critter Control. Uh, here in Atlanta, Northwest, you know, the Northwest mouse on all the billboards is uh, is one of our companies. Fantastic. Thanks, Lee. And Dwayne. Uh, good morning. I'm Dwayne Wilcox. I'm the CIO uh, for ThyssenKrupp Elevators America. Uh, ThyssenKrupp is a uh, global elevator uh, escalator and jetway manufacturer and service company. Um, we're about $9 billion globally. And um, I'm responsible for all of our major transformations uh, all throughout the Americas. Uh, we're changing our business um, from everything from how we manufacture and configure products to uh, how we uh, service and, and digitally prepare ourselves for the future and our uh, global service workforce. So uh, happy to be here this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. I bet, I bet you did not uh, expect the transformation was going to include a pandemic. So I'm excited to hear a little bit about that. <laughs> Uh, and Mr. Davis, Kevin, why don't you go ahead? Hey, good morning, Kevin Davis. Um, I'm Vice President of Analytics and Architecture at K-Force. Uh, K-Force is a billion and a half dollar staffing firm. Um, we staff mostly technical jobs, so uh, you know, developers and that sort of thing. Um, for us, um, the staffing industry is going through rapid changes with multiple types of digital transformation, including bots and how recruiters and, uh, work. Um, so uh, my team, as far as analytics, has been measuring a lot of that transformation. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. That's, um, that's incredible. So as always, uh, we're talking today about change. Um, and as always in these types of environments, we have a little bit of change that we're going to do right now. Um, our uh, illustrious moderator is having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to step in. And uh, they say stronger together, so we'll be stronger uh, without in the short term, and then hopefully we'll get better when he gets back on. But the idea for this forum was, um, you know, the more and more customers we talk to, the more we realized that people were going through different stages. There was this initial reaction stage um, where businesses you know, had to make sure their employees were safe, had to put a lot of drastic measures in place overnight um, and really became in a very reactive mode, uh, something that no one likes to do in a business sense. And then as, as time went on and kind of things got um, completed or 
adjustments were made, some of them very tough adjustments, we started seeing uh, companies start shifting more towards what's recovery going to look like. Um, and as we come out of this, with all the uncertainty, what are the changes we're making in the business and, and what is the way that we're going to continue um, to hit some of the targets that we had in 2020 or at least some of the accomplishments we're striving towards and keep thriving. Um, and then obviously the ideal next date is to start to reimagine. Um, you know, Churchill said, don't ever let a crisis go to waste. And so I think in crisis, there's opportunities to reimagine what your business can be. And with as much change as we're having, there's definitely a need to adjust, especially when we talk about the customer side um, or some of the ways that people interact in industries highly affected like retail, hospitality, et cetera. So the idea today was to get um, some business leaders from around the country together and talk about not only these phases, but um, how data and analytics played a part in those phases and how it was leveraged or where there were maybe gaps in leverage uh, to share some of those insights with the audience and start to give an idea of how the best companies um, are getting through these tough times. So on that note, um, let's go ahead and dive in. And I will start with you, Rusty, since that's where we started the introductions. And if we go back to when the pandemic first started um, and when, when you were in what I'm calling the react phase, maybe give me a sense of how quickly were you able to get your staff mobilized and kind of weather the storm? Yeah. Um, good question. First, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we were well on the road to uh, really um, enhancing the technology platforms that we had. So I didn't have the normal resistance you'd have with uh, uh, legacy inertia and things like that. So we were able to really quickly send everybody home. Uh, non we have plants across the country uh, and, and our process for manufacturing allows folks to be fairly uh, apart from each other anyway. So we were able to uh, allow them to keep functioning. And then the biggest challenge we had was uh, our customer service area. And then, and we're, you know, very folk, our business process really leans on, on those folks. It's an area that we're looking to change, but uh, so we just had to get laptops for them. We had a, a call center platform that was already SaaS uh, based. So once we we're able to do that, the biggest challenge we had was uh, internet connectivity for some of those folks. Uh, and, you know, so we had to distribute some hotspots and things like that to, uh, uh, to get them going. But other than that, we were very fortunate in that uh, we were already out in front of a bunch of this. So, uh, you know, I, I think a couple of my, fellow panelists here have uh, executives who are really based in different parts of the country. We do too. And so um, uh, we were able to really let them just stay home, do what they have to do and, and the rest of us as well. So very fortunate. That is fortunate. How about you, Lee? Did you, did you guys have the same fortune or were there some challenges? Well, I mean, there's always challenges because there were a lot of changes required, but uh I know this isn't required. I want to give a shout out to my uh, CCG team and Greg and Natalie and Woody, um, because years ago, as we got started down this data analytics path, uh, they were critical in helping <clears throat> us implement uh, some, some tools that we just live and breathe by as a business. And as a result of that, we were able very quickly to know that, hey, this thing this thing's a little bit bigger. Um, you know, than we're hearing on the news. And we knew right away from our daily operations report, which is real time and 500 locations across the country, uh, that we had pockets, you know, we had some anomalies on our key operating indicators uh, in terms of scheduled production not being done and reached out and found out, for example, in New York City, our technicians were showing up to service a restaurant or a bar or a hotel, uh, and they were closed. Uh, they couldn't get in to do the service. So uh, we had kind of a, a head start that this thing was going to be bigger. And our executive steering committee uh, began meeting uh, daily uh, for two hours to uh, determine how we were going to respond to this. And one of the good things that, that came out of it, I think they always thought highly of IT anyway and what we were providing them. Uh, but for the first two or three weeks, as we mobilized folks 
uh, and had them uh, working from home with no disruption, we were able to change immediately our communications to our customers and let them know that we would be focusing first on outside service. We'd only come inside if they wanted us to, uh, that our technicians would be masked and gloved and um, and, and shared our, our safety protocols. All that went into effect immediately. We got a lot of good feedback from our customers as to how much uh, they appreciated that. So. Uh, you know, analytics on this one allowed us to respond a lot more quickly than we ever would have. We have uh, uh, one very large national call center with about 150 agents, uh, about 55 miles down the road in Covington, Georgia, and probably eight or 10 smaller uh, divisional based call centers of maybe 20, 30 people. And uh, our telecommunicate our via uh, folks they actually uh, gave us we had 150 licenses from a business continuity but we had never planned on every building having to be <laughs> vacated we always plan you know disaster recovery is one might burn down but they're not all going to burn down all over the country uh, they actually lent us free for 90 days the licenses to send all those people home so we have hundreds of employees taking customer phone calls and sales calls from their home. And amazingly, we found out that our uh, productivity and our close ratios actually went up uh, as a result of, of people working from home, go figure. Uh, so it'll be interesting. You've all seen the meme of who is driving transformation at your company. Is it the right. CEO, the COO, the CIO, or COVID-19? And COVID-19, hands down, is uh, driving transformation much faster than we would have uh, if it hadn't happened. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that theme. Um, and, and as we talk about transformation, that's a nice segue uh, over to Dwayne. But before you jump in, Dwayne, and talk a little bit about how you guys mobilized maybe with staff and, and, and maybe some of the, the areas that data looked into, there is um, an incredible consistency amongst everyone that I've spoken to that they are doing things so much faster um, than they had in the past. And that this clarity and focus that the crisis has brought on has enabled them to accomplish things that previously would have taken months um, in a matter of weeks just because they had to. So I'd love to hear at TKE um, and examples that you had around mobilizing staff or where data may have played a part in your early on decisions. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was, it took us uh, very little time to move about uh, half our workforce, uh, um, about 20,000 people um, to working from home or, you know, off, off site. And um, I think one of the bigger challenges we had was just our, our call centers. We operate 911 like call centers for elevator service and entrapments and, and other issues like that. And, and uh, fortunately, uh, we were already moving to the cloud with uh, a lot of our call center technology and already signed some contracts and we're beginning our project. Uh, we were able to accelerate that project um, and within a week had moved all of our call centers to remote and into the cloud with, with really no impact. In fact, what we saw was improved call handling time. So um, it was quite amazing what we were, were able to, to accomplish when we did that. Um, you know, we had the usual challenges too, though. We had to, you know, equip people maybe more laptops and we'd like to purchase uh, a lot of headsets mm -hmm. and other things. But, you know, fortunately uh, our supply chain came through for us uh, quite well. Uh, we have a huge mobile workforce, probably similar to, to what Lee mentioned and Rollins that's providing service out there. And what our data was telling us was something similar. We were seeing uh, actually spikes in, in service needs in, in healthcare and government uh, and residential. And of course, huge drop-offs in, airports, uh, hotels, retail, et cetera. So um, it helped us prioritize our workforce, uh, our preventative maintenance, um, and also just reach out to our customers, um, which I, we got a, a lot of accolades and appreciation for, um, you know, that understanding those businesses that were shut down uh, or, or those that were just under, you know, stress, right? So um, it was a, it was a pretty amazing time for us to be able to, to see the data, what's going on in our business, and then um, talk to our customers directly. 
you know, and one thing we saw too was even some of the customers that were shut down uh, decided that, hey, now's a perfect time to do extra service or remodel or, or um, you know, really modernize their equipment or other things. So while uh, traffic was down, so uh, yeah. we got some additional demand we really weren't expecting. So that was kind of nice as well. That is nice. You know, it's funny. Um, I was talking to another CIO and he said, uh, we've been executing on a RAM strategy. And, and I said, what is RAM? And he said, rapid asset management, because we've been rolling assets out at an incredible pace to, um, to get to all our remote workforce. So yeah, there's definitely some governance conversations in there around what it's like to manage data when your whole entire workforce is mobilized. But um, great, thank you very much for that doing. Kevin, so um, give me an idea. K4 is a little different business model than, than the rest of the folks on the panel, but um, give us an idea of, of what it was like to mobilize staff initially and, and kind of how that went over. Yeah, um, so K-Force, we have about 50 offices nationwide, and um, um, maybe two years ago or so, um, the firm made a decision that everyone gets a laptop, and uh, then we had a pretty liberal work from remote, work from home policy already, where people could work for two days from home. Um, so that was mostly for the back office people. Um, so for for that part, um, we were okay. We had the technology, we had the laptops. Um, the biggest part was the actual recruiters in the field not going to the office because they always go to the office. And, um, what we saw was, you know, the, the bandwidth. We just had to we had to balance two data centers, but the bandwidth was there. Everything was there. Turning it on was pretty quick. In fact, uh, in our last earnings call, the uh, uh, CEO Dave Dunkel uh, complimented how quickly we went over to to adapt the, to the uh, remote workforce. Um, but, but from an analytics point of view, what was interesting is we have a balanced scorecard and we have a ways to measure productivity in the business and everything already. Um, but it was interesting that as soon as we went full remote, um, people were asking about other types of productivity measures and we had to back them off. So, you know, people were asking like, you know, how many people are on the phone and are they, are they dialing the right people? And, and we had to back them off and say, we have measures in place. So let's let the measures speak for themselves. Um, and just like we've heard from Lee, um, our productivity actually went bumped up a little bit. Yeah, the productivity piece is really interesting, um, and I'm very curious to see how that continues because uh, I was joking with my wife that productivity is high because no one has an opportunity cost. Um, there's there's not much to do, and so when you're when you're in shelter in place and you're in your home, um, you know, you're able to work 16, 18 hours uh, if you want to, and a lot of people work as sanity, and I think it provides them a an out to feel normal again. Um, It'll be interesting to see when the, when the world opens back up fully, um, if that productivity stays and, and how much the change piece plays in. Um, well, John Bastone, welcome to the party. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I'm happy to see your face and that you're able to join. Uh, I went around the room Thanks, and talked to, I, I introduced all the panelists, went around the room and talked a little bit um, just about in the reaction <clears> phase, uh, how they were mobilizing staff um, and some of the ways that they utilize data for that piece, but without further ado, I will hand the mic over to you, and thanks, gentlemen. Awesome, thanks guys, sorry I'm late, uh, uh, PC issues, but uh, I'm, I'm back online. Um, Dwayne, I, I, I was able to uh, listen in on, on some of the responses, and I, I don't think you um, uh, you covered this, correct me if I, if I did, but uh, I kind of wanted to go back uh, to the beginning of, of this crisis and get some anecdotes on on when you first knew uh, it, it it hit the proverbial fan, and I think uh, you had an anecdote uh, uh, about uh, how you first realized that you had an oh shit moment. So, so if you uh, could, uh, if you yeah, could was, enlighten the audience, that would be great. Yeah, it was in. I was actually in Germany. Um, I think it was a Wednesday evening, um, uh, early in March, and I got a call from my. American CEO uh, telling me that uh, it was about 2 a.m. in the morning, my time, that uh, Trump had just uh, was closing the borders and shutting down uh, European travel. So uh, I better find a way home soon. <laughs> so uh, that's when it when it first began. We were I happened to be over there as one of the last few of what I, we called essential uh, global travelers at the time because of uh, what we we're we're going through here at, at TKA. We're in the middle of a um, a company split. We're being acquired by uh, private equity, um, just 
just our elevator division and we're separating from uh, uh, Tissen Krupp Global. Uh, we call it Tissen Krupp AG. Uh, I was over there planning a couple of different uh, separation activities as well as uh, just kind of what our standalone operations would be, uh, you know, uh, post divestiture. And um, yeah, so it was uh, kind of an eye opening moment. And uh, I was in meetings with, you know, people from all over the world too. So Hong Kong was shutting down. Um, which we had members uh, there doing the same thing. So we all kind of had to scramble uh, in the last 48 hours, I call it. Uh, and then come back, obviously, from there, uh, really kind of manage the, the shift to work from home. Uh, we started to make those decisions uh, really um, in that next 24 hours. So throughout that weekend and everything else. So, yeah, quite quick. And Lee, I, I know similarly, uh, I, Rollins is obviously uh, global uh, in, in scope. Uh, how, how early on uh, was your uh, C-suite really engaged on on recognizing this is uh, this is bigger than than anything we've dealt with before? You know, this is a horrible thing to say. I don't remember. Um, I know that we were out ahead of a lot of the businesses in this area in terms of getting our folks home which frankly surprised the hell out of me because we are one of the most conservative uh, companies when it comes to things like that. Um, but the company really uh, did the right thing and said, you know, we, uh, with all of this going on, we've got to allow folks to do this. It's interesting, uh, much like Kevin said, one of the first concerns is, well, if they're at home, they're not going to work. How, you know, we need spyware so we can check on them and make sure they're doing their jobs. And I remember it was, it was, uh, we were in the executive meeting room. We had about uh, four or five of the executives in there. We had another four or five on the team's call that we were talking to. And it was a Friday morning. It was payday. And I said, did you guys all get your checks today? And they said, yeah. I said, have you heard any calls from any of your employees who didn't get their paychecks today? No. I said, well, then payroll's obviously working. Uh, so I don't know why you want spyware. Uh, you know, you can, you can look at your metrics, the daily operations reports and the analytics that we provide will tell you how the business is running. And you just need to manage the way you always manage. It doesn't matter that, that the people aren't here at the office you'll know. And uh, uh, so everybody was uh, very cool with that and, uh, and it worked. Uh, so, uh, but you know, I can't, I, I know it was uh, very early in March, but I, I'd have to go back through my calendars and give you an exact date. But we, you know, we formed basically, uh, we went agile real fast, which, uh, you know, we, we were agile in yeah. IT. We're not always agile in our business, uh, but boy, we got agile real fast, and it's it's really been fun to watch. So now, Rusty, uh, you know, Lee brings up some good points around um, uh, just this cultural mindset that had to shift right over overnight in terms of uh, allowing and trusting, you know, that people are you know can can work and be productive at home, and and you and you know in, in the manufacturing sector. Uh, it's there. That's probably about as old school as it gets uh, in terms of thinking, in terms of process. Uh, walk me through a little bit about how how you guys had to turn on a dime and 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 really overcoming you know some of those biases. Yeah, we. Um, I guess we. Our earliest signal was um, in our supply chain, as you might imagine. Um, we had mm -hmm. uh, within the six months prior to this thing hitting, <clears throat> we had. Uh, uh, really shifted supply chain from domestic suppliers to, you know, uh, some suppliers out of China and uh, Turkey and other places in Europe. And, uh, and so, you know, just in time to be uh, to put us at, at risk of uh, of uh, production. So uh, we really got some early signals from them. You know, the biggest, I think, pivot for us was you know, no one's ever heard of us. We're the we're the largest private label match manufacturer in the country, and and uh, um, but we've so we've been really serving retailers uh, and and branding products for them. Mm. Well, they wanted to also pivot, um, uh, and 
drop ship direct to customers. So we started, we've all already had a very small part of our business that's growing that we really launched last year, uh, direct to consumer uh, and Amazon and the rest of those things. So our, our biggest pivot was really trying to get these decades old uh, retailers um, to really switch horses midstream. And, and so we, we've had, you can imagine all the uh, internal systems and processes we had to change to, uh, uh, to, to shift. And, and instead of sending truckloads of mattresses to a retailer, um, we have to drop ship everything to their consumers who order uh, either online or, or in a store, but uh, bed in the box kind of thing is, pro is most of what the, uh, the drop ship stuff is. So pretty big shift for us. Manufacturing itself was uh, pretty stable. We had to have all the new um, CDC guidelines in terms of cleaning, and, and our, our COO was very, very sharp. And, and you know, he had all the uh, the plans ready for when um, someone does get sick, and we've had a couple of those. Um, how do we treat it? You know, quarantine for them, and and what do we do with the rest of the employees, and checking temperatures and things like that. So uh, they they react pretty quick. Rusty, as a follow up on that, just. Uh, I'm kind of leaping ahead to, to sort of the reimagine uh, piece, but I mean, do you, do you have any sort of point of view on what retail, you know, potentially is, is going to look like uh, on the other end of this? Do you think it's it's uh, a blip or do you think it's potentially changed uh, forever? That's a great question. You know, uh, I think we started off a, a pretty blind company when I got there. When I, when I, took the role. I had already contacted CCG because we had worked together at my last company. And I think I made Brian Rhymes pretty nervous uh, with the pace that I was already uh, um, told him I wanted to run at. But what we what we did early was really we amassed probably the best knowledge base of, of the mattress buying consumer in the industry. I mean, we know more about those consumers than, than re big name retailers that you know of. And so we started to see this kind of shift. And um, all, mattresses are kind of a weird thing, though. It, it's, you know, uh, you, you really want to lay on it. The older I get, the more important that is, it seems. But, uh, um, you know, we have a very, very low return rate. You, we, Whereas you look at the folks that are the, the brand names for the online mattresses, they've got horrendous return rates, 25%. And, uh, um, it's, and it's really probably not so much the product itself. It's a fact that the, the buyer didn't, didn't experience it before they committed to buying it. And so I see for the mattresses still, it's, it's over 20% of mattresses bought uh, back in 2018, I think, were, uh, were they never went into a store. Uh, and I, I see that trend uh, continuing um, for us. But I do see, I think the pendulum will swing back to a degree, but it's not going to land where it used to be, um, I don't think. Got it. And Kevin, I know uh, uh, your team early on was involved in, uh, in, in sort of the mobilization of, of, of what the company had to do to, uh, to react to this. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about or talk, tell the audience a little bit about how you felt like uh, IT, uh, much as uh, Rusty shared earlier, IT was almost a, a step ahead in, in being ready and, and how it, it sort of uh, coached the rest of the organization? Yeah, so um, we about six to eight months ago, um, we as a firm in the back office decided to do hoteling um, for cubicles um, to save space. So in order to do that, um, you know, everyone didn't have a permanent place. They had to check in and check out. So uh, the workforce, um, IT and financial operations were the only two that went full time hoteling. And by doing that, um, we kind of started the whole change management culture shift of, you know, working from home because, uh, you had to take all your stuff home anyway. So people had already started making their desk at home, uh, getting situated, having their that docking stations and their and their headsets and that sort of thing. So we were pretty fortunate that we were months ahead. So uh, when we made the shift, that wasn't too bad for the back office. So, right. Yeah, I mean, show of hands, uh, uh, old school. Uh, it, how many how many of you on the, on the panel uh, are seriously considering some sort of a hoteling uh, protocol for office positions uh, go forward. Yep, we already do. Yeah. In so fact, uh, is, we're, uh, looking, we're looking at full-time remote. <laughs> are you? Yeah. Yeah, it, uh, I, you know, that brings me to another question, Kevin, uh, around um, uh, you know the nature of professional services and consulting going forward. I know one of the thoughts uh, I've had at length as, as I've talked to a lot of our customers is 
uh, as customers of ours uh, and prospects are um, becoming more virtual, the whole nature of consulting changes because uh, you know often we, we've got to be on a client site to kick off a project to, to to see through key milestones. All of a sudden, that anchor of of what has been uh, sort of a standardized consulting model is is <laughs> out to sea. Uh, and so, as it relates to your core business, um, uh, you know, how does that impact how you hire? Like, how important is geography at this point? Uh, for, you know, certain skills that, that you're hiring for in accounting and IT and, and you know, finance uh, now and, and potentially in the future? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we have a um, matching uh, model, basically an algorithm that matches candidates to, to job offers um, to give the associate kind of a leg up so they don't have to do that part. Um, one of the main variables in that model has always been geography. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to take that geography variable out and see what happens, see how, how uh, drastically it changes. Um, the other thing um, we've been t testing around with is um, how do you how do you find exactly a candidate um, on what we call the top of the funnel? So we, we will do matching and then we'll do multiple different layers before we ever get them to the associate. So there's lots of um, AI and modeling and happening before it ever gets to the associate on now. And and the point of that is is to <clears throat> reduce their time of um, what we call the non-value added tasks. Um, so from a matching standpoint, that's how. Um, you mentioned the consulting side, the actual shift of work from consulting. Um, we're definitely gonna see that. Um, and a couple of things that we've thought about, um, other guys would have a lot of real estate, probably have two, but we have again, 50 offices. And as our clients see their shift go to full-time remote or full-time offsite, um, we are thinking about taking some of our uh, offices and making them uh, consulting centers and having you know our clients and us go to a small consulting area if you want to and have a team build there. So not necessarily have to have offices, but maybe revamping and, and uh, revaluing those that real estate to, to have for, for clients. Yeah, I, I, that, that all makes sense. Um, Oh, well, let's let's shift to uh, sort of the recover theme of uh, of today's uh, panel. I mean, it's uh, there are early signs that uh, that that there's been a pivot. Uh, you know, restaurants are starting to phase in, seating, gyms are reopening, hospitals are, are resuming elective procedures. But uh, you know, of course, things aren't what they were in January, and there's a lot of unprecedented uncertainty on, on what the road ahead looks like. Uh, all of you run or oversee or, or have alignment with uh, analytics teams for your respective organization. Uh, and analytics is is unique in its mission of often being tasked with uh, uh, foretelling or foreseeing the future, you know, what's ahead. And I'd love for each of you to talk about uh, the importance analytics uh, is, is playing or has played as you're uh, navigating uh, a recovery. We'll, we'll start with uh, Dwayne. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, it, it's 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 been important for us throughout this whole process, really, as we kind of watched uh, the, the country shut down. So now thinking about, okay, how do we maintain operations, and and then also, um, you know, how do we, I say, maintain our financials? So you know, looking at different trends of our customers, et cetera, and also thinking about cash and collections and obviously uh, cash preservation throughout our process. Um, but looking at our data, we started to look at, we have a very large IOT footprint uh, in the Americas on our MAX platform, which is monitoring elevator escalator usage and also maintain, monitoring the systems themselves. So giving us any kind of air conditions, air patterns, et cetera. And, and from the traffic data, we could, we could see, um, some some great trends. You know, we we could start to isolate which uh, which of our customers or industries are doing well, um, maintaining traffic, increasing traffic, um, and then what are those are really going to be suffering, and then really starting to tie some of our economic data to our usage data um, to really kind of predict different models for us for the future, and also guide some of our back office operations and uh, where we might have uh, collections challenges or or future sales challenges, et cetera. And we started to direct. Uh, our sales teams in a similar fashion too. So um, just in those early early stages, uh, we started to think about how do we use our data to really protect our business while we're going through this, 
And, um, and then what is it going to look like when we come out and start preparing ourselves for uh, how to make that transition? Very good. Rusty, what's your experience been? Uh, similar to what, what Dwayne said, you know, we um, were able to deploy a lot of analytics probably two years ago in this business. And it um, was just in time for a new CEO who's a very data driven, technology savvy uh, leader. And uh, Every conversation in our business changed, uh, you know, from the normal, you know, sales rhetoric uh, um, to uh, data. And what we discovered was that there were customers, there were products, there were price lists, there were sales reps where we were losing money. And um, in 2019, we were actually down over 20 percent in sales, but our EBITDA was up 60 percent. And it was because these guys were able to just get rid of products that we weren't uh that weren't profitable, customers, sales reps, everything. And so they've, they've already got this mindset um, to, uh, and even third-party sales reps, everyone is measured based on the, uh, their dashboard and their performance. There's, there's no, it, it's, it, it's uh, as an old fo football coach used to say, the film doesn't lie. And, um, uh, and so they, they've got the data there. What we're looking to do now is, um, given all the change we've seen in how we conduct business and how we service both consumers and retailers, we've got to change our ERP when we're relooking at the entire order of the cash process because it's it's been very old school and very reliant on people. And I mentioned that early with our customer service. And so we've trained our customers to, to not really give us 100% accurate data in terms of product or prices or anything like that, and we'll fix it. On the way and we just can't keep doing business that way and so the very first thing we're talking about is what do we want to measure with this new order the cash process what do we want to measure and then uh you know what is what is the good look like and then uh it's just going to feed right into our analytics platform so uh, over and above what we've done with consumers and customers we manage every aspect of our business every week we're looking at our kpi and and all the way down to contribution margin and uh so it's all a fact-based conversation now, uh, which is good, except when we have a blip somewhere in our analytics uh, feed or something like that. It's, it's uh, any time, day or night, weekend, doesn't matter, you know, it's where we're getting a call. But uh, but that, that really, really happens. So uh, it's been good, you know, because uh, facts don't lie. Yeah. Leah, I love your perspective on this as well, and, and maybe a bit of context for the audience. I know uh, Rollins, it consists of a uh, number of, as I understand it, wholly owned subsidiaries that uh, that are different uh, pest uh, control type of uh, companies globally. You know, how how ultimately does that roll up uh, from from an analytics responsibility perspective for 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 the centralized teams that you know that you're a part of, and and to what extent uh, is analytics really uh, helping you guys navigate? Well, anytime anybody does something operationally. Uh, you know, a record's created and, and it's rolled up and it's available real time uh, at whatever level that uh, a manager or a regional manager or division president uh, wants to look at at their level. And then if they see an issue or a problem drilled down uh, to uh, down to a route level to see if there's a specific technician uh, that's having uh, cancellations, for example, that are, are higher than than normal. Um, we're very lucky. Uh, my boss, Gary Rollins, is fond of saying that rats and roaches don't read the Wall Street Journal. And the good news for us is we come out of this, uh, if you're a restaurant and you have to social distance and you can only have half the people in the restaurant you normally would, you still can't have rats or roaches, uh, you know, because uh, that's just not acceptable uh, in that environment. So uh, we're not something that they can put off too long. The other thing that we saw happening in New York, which was was interesting, was as these places closed and all of a sudden their dumpsters did not have all of the uh, the stuff that a restaurant dumpster normally has in it, uh, our residential business has increased. I mean, it's off off the charts because this wildlife uh, has to eat, so it goes looking somewhere else. And for instance, critter control, which is uh, our wildlife, uh, 
uh, you know, as the, the dumpsters are empty, they, they start going, you know, into uh, residential areas and looking for what they can, what they can find there. So, uh, you know, we're monitoring that all very, very carefully. Uh, we have technicians that specialize on the commercial side of the business versus the residential. It's, it's a little bit different skill set uh, and uh, experience requirement. Uh, but we're able to repurpose those commercial technicians into the residential market. Because, you know, with all these folks staying at home full time, they're seeing they're seeing things that perhaps they wouldn't have seen before, right? And uh, they're picking up the phone and calling us. So, so that's been good. Yeah, I, you know, as a follow up on that, uh, and something we'll dive into a, a little bit later in, in the in the conversation. I, 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 obviously, businesses have had to adapt, uh, but households and consumers have had to adapt as well. And, and uh, consumer behavior has changed um, overnight. Uh, or at least over over the last month, I know. Uh, yeah, I, I cover the retail space quite a bit, and uh, you know, certain sectors of retail have gone from uh, majority brick and order to almost uh, you know entirely uh, you know curbside or, or or delivery, and that that's fundamentally changing promotions and advertising and and, and how you stock products and and you know just the whole nature of of, of retailing. And I would imagine. Um, in, in, in pest control, right? You, all of a sudden you have uh, people who ordinarily are away from work, away for work, now they're home all the time. So the hours that they would maybe take an appointment or or the, the amount of time they're now in the home to notice things that were unnoticeable has fundamentally changed. I mean, is are there are there any sort of insights you can share on on how you're 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 trying to stay attuned to changing customer behavior, whether a customer is a person or, or business, and how that informs, uh, you know, how you adapt? Uh, you know, I think the, the whole key to that is communication. Uh, certainly, we have a lot of folks, as we do our services during the day, it used to be we would do external only, and then if the customer had a problem and wanted us to come inside, we'd make an appointment because again, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, both people uh, in, in, the, in the household are working. So there's nobody at home during the day. Uh, so this actually has been easier for us. We've had less reschedule requests because somebody's mm. always home, right? Um, right. I think, uh, you know, Rusty said a little bit earlier that you know, the pendulum is going to swing back. It's just not going to swing back all the way. I think human nature is, um, and, you know, I, I don't know about all of you. I haven't been working from home, but I know when I talk to people who have been, they can, there's a lot of folks that cannot wait to get back to work or out to a restaurant or uh, I just want to go to a store and shop and be around people and get the hell out of my house and get the hell away from you, right? <laughs> uh, you know, human nature is we are not gonna we are not gonna live in a cave the rest of our life. And uh, but having said that, I, I don't think it's gonna go all the way back the way it was. I think there's a lot of things we learned through this. For example, I know for us, uh, we we have a tremendous amount of travel expense because again, 500 branches around the country. A region manager has 12 to 15 branches that that they're rotating around and, and visiting, and a division president is typically traveling four days out of five. Um, and then support staff, internal audit, all those. I mean, just travel all the time. Well. One of the things that, again, is that people have discovered, even though we've been saying it, uh, is that you can use Teams uh, to have a meeting. You can share files and presentations. Internal audit can look at all your data. Um, and uh, so I just think that there's going to be uh, – we're going to see some difference. I don't. I don't think we're going to keep going the way we have. Just because we can, I don't think people are going to want to. I think that there'll there'll be a, a migration back to the way things were. Right. 
Hey, Kevin, I, I, I'm back on the topic of uh, uh, ways that analytics is, is helping inform uh, decisions. You know, at, at, the, at the executive level, what, what are do you have any anecdotes around um, some of the things you've had to do, whether scenario planning or, or, or otherwise, uh, that that have been essential to, to to trying to come up with a crystal ball of of how to navigate the days and weeks ahead? Yeah. So if um, if you're not familiar with how staffing works, we have what they call a uh, a, a placement date. That's when a contractor starts on a on a job. And then you have what they call the end date, when is obviously the time that they're going to end. So if you sign up for a six-month term or six-month contract, you have a starting date, and six months later you have an end date. Okay. Um, I think it was Rusty that said sales rhetoric. I'm going to have to use that later because we're so <laughs> dependent on the data being put into our CRM system so we can measure it um, that that came to light. Everybody, everybody knew it, but everybody kind of avoided it. You know, kind of the elephant in the room for a little while. Uh, when we created the impact dashboard, which was what we did is we created a a a, um, um, a flag in our CRM system that said this this job is ending because of COVID, right? So it's an end, end flag, right? And so we were tracking all of them. So we could take and say, whichever one was ended prior to when it should have been, um, that's our impact. And so we started looking at it and it was immediately some people saying, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait, that, that's not right, you know, because the number was you know, pretty big because people were just putting in end of the year dates or something like that, right? Uh, so it, it kind of exposed a couple things, data quality, you know, it, it's at the data entry piece, but it obviously um, was a major dashboard that's uh, actually being sent every Tuesday morning to the, the highest of the high people in, in K-Force showing what the impact is. So is the impact either furlough or a reduced rate or a complete end of the, the contract? Um, so uh, that is one something that they they literally ask for, you know, before we even get it to them on Tuesday morning. Got it. Um, last, you know, last question on on the topic of uh, recovery to kind of uh, tie a bow on this. Um, uh, assuming things, you know, start to get better, um, uh, as as you have the luxury of kind of looking back at the last two or three months. Um, if, if you had to net out one uh, sort of lesson learned, one really valuable sort of takeaway uh, that you would want to apply potentially to the next crisis, to, 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 regardless of, of business you're in or, or what the crisis is, what, what would you say? What would you say that would be? And we'll start with uh, Dwayne. Sort of one key takeaway. Yep. This is something that, you know, if it's faced with a crisis again, uh, granted, we're not out of this crisis yet, but you know, for the next one, really key lesson learned that, that we would apply. Well, I think that our, you know, uh, the technology enablement strategy has to consider um, that this no touch potential world, right, where you can do things virtually, see things virtually. So how do you unlock the capabilities in your business um, that allow for that. And I'll, you know, a couple of examples where we all had to do it, you know, with our internal workforces, but, you know, what are we doing with our customers for the same thing? And, you know, we were fortunate in this process. We had just launched a uh, new digital services capability with our Max IoT platform that, you know, not only allows our technicians to see what's going on in these buildings remotely, but we can, we opened it up to our customers. And, and during this pandemic, as things were shutting down, people were, you know, scared to have face-to-face -face contact or, you know, even for us to send technicians into buildings, you know, they became a little anxious and nervous too at different times during this pandemic. That, that ability to see what's going on and expose what's going on in those systems um, uh, remotely was, was really key. And I think it just, it validated everything about what we should be doing digitally going forward. Great. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, what about you, Rusty? He, uh, no, I think take away. The, the whole notion of kind of collaboration and, and, and productivity, and Lee brought that up earlier, I think um, the myth has been busted in terms of if you don't all have to be in the same room or the same building. Uh, and But I do think that... Um, 
we're going to take this to the next level and really leverage these platforms. We, we you know, we were using Teams and, and Skype prior to that. Um, but uh, I think we'll be able to uh, really change internally how we function. Uh, we're, and we're looking to get rid of a bunch of the uh, real estate we've got in Dallas, in fact. Um, I just don't think we need to pay that money. But I, I, so I think there's going to be some internal change with what we feel we need uh, from a presence standpoint uh, to uh, to be effective and collaborate. And um, uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, how sales continues to work with our traditional retailers and, and also the uh, the direct to consumer. I expect that to last uh, th this shift. And I think it was a bit of an eye opener. Um, for a bunch of our retailers, uh, you know, that trying to find a new way to survive. And most of these are, are we've got thousands of furniture stores, you know, uh, most you've never heard of, Bob's Bed Barn or something like that, you know, and, and, and uh, um, they've had to learn how to be um, a bit more nimble and never really thought about it. Uh, so I, I expect that to have a ripple um, uh, as well. So and I think technology will really be uh, kind of the backbone of most of the options that, that, uh, that we come across. Got it. Mr. Crump, uh, any sort of key takeaway for your uh, for your book uh, that I'm sure you'll write on this in, you know, in, in the future? <laughs> uh, I, I, I think a couple. I think that uh, anything we build uh, going forward, any, anything we provide to our employees and our customers needs to be uh, able to uh, work properly, regardless of where the person is that's using it. And whether or not they, I mean, it needs to be work through cellular as well as internet. If there's no internet available, let's let's make sure that that people can communicate that way. Uh, security is also a concern in that one of the our lessons learned was as we sent equipment home with people, all of a sudden it wasn't on our network anymore. And how do you apply patches and and make sure that the the security is maintained? Uh, so we've developed all that, and, and we'll make sure that uh, we keep that going forward. And then the other thing is, um, it is absolutely amazing to me, how and I, I love this country. I think that, uh, you know, sure, we've got our flaws, but there's something about Americans when uh, something like this happens. It is unbelievable how much we can do and how much we can accomplish how we work together, and uh, how quickly things happen. And uh, I think everybody here will attest to the fact that uh, they've done things in the last six to eight weeks that without COVID-19 would have taken six to eight months or six to eight years, uh, just because mm -hmm. people, uh, if, if there is no burning platform, if there is no COVID-19 or 9-11, uh, you know, human beings just kind of, they, they, they hate change. And uh, I, I am just, I mean, when I look around and I, I talk to, you know, people like those on the panel, and I know what our experience was, and I talk to other people, it is just amazing how um, we, we in the United States have responded to all this and how quickly we've moved. It's, it really makes you feel proud. Yeah, amen. Mr. Davis, big uh, key lesson learned. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I kind of echo in some of Lee's things, the, the, the speed at which we could do things was a big, uh, was a big lesson learned. Um, for us, um, K-Force, I'm sure everybody else too, but uh, K-Force is ripe with a whole bunch of manual processes. Um, these manual processes, you know, they, people will build their own little file system or SharePoint site or something on the side and that sort of thing. Um, the biggest thing we learned from a cultural standpoint um, is um, if you take a step back and do something the right way, you can save yourself a lot of time. Um, what we had here was a um, we had a, a, an immediate need for a large client to staff, um, believe it or not, like a thousand people in, in two weeks. So we um, we had to adjust our systems and, and get everything in. And what happened was the the operations team, you know, trying to do the best that they could, um, they they built a system outside of the normal system. So we, we said time out, you know, let's, let's get IT involved, let's get architecture involved, and let's get it done right. And 
we took two steps back um, and then created the system that actually worked and it just accelerated because then a second client came in right after that. So without that, we would have uh, we would really been in trouble. Um, but the key takeaway is, is you know, the, the, the cultural shift of how we all have to kind of band together, um, even though, you know, we're not in the office. Um, and these manual processes, I think we're going to expose a lot of them in the next couple months. Yeah, good point. Uh, before we move on to the uh, reinvent team, uh, last of the three, uh, housekeeping item I, I, I would have covered uh, up front, but I was I was occupied. Um, uh, for for those of you, uh, and I know that a lot of you are out there that are listening in, um, feel free to start uh, submitting questions through the uh, uh, question uh, toolbar uh, that's that's available in the um, in the application. Uh, I, I'll lay eyes on them as, as the panelists are uh, uh, talking, and if it's better than a question uh, that I intended to raise, I'll, I'll, I'll make it part of the uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll also save them for the, for the end. We will have some time for, for audience Q&A uh, at the end. Other uh, housekeeping item is for the panelists uh, in, in front of me right now. If any of you want to ask uh, any of the other panelists, any questions, uh, uh, speak up, because uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been covered that wasn't necessarily even aware to me, <laughs> let alone you guys. Uh, and, and so I'm not the only one that can ask follow-up questions if, if, if you have a question that uh, strikes you as, uh, as, as worth asking. Uh, with, with that, we'll move into the, um, uh, the last theme, which is reinvention. Uh, uh, so here I want to talk about, I want you to talk about really a, a life in a post-pandemic, or at least a post-COVID-19 uh, world. Um, and so there's there's been something that, that's come up a lot uh, that I want you guys to elaborate on, and, and that's the future of work. Uh, you know, all of you have had experience moving companies uh, to work from home. Uh, we've already gotten points of view on, on, on whether it's here to stay, uh, as where the, you know, what the implications are. Um, you know, I, I guess the question I'd pose is, do you think we're going to be better off for this in, in the long run? Or is it just is it just something, you know, we have to adapt to? And Dwayne, I'll, I'll start with you or whoever wants to speak up. Um, if not, I'll well, I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to go. Um, well, I mean, I, I think we've hit on a couple of things. I, I, I do think it's going to change the way we work. I, I think we are going to have um, a lot more faith in in some of these collaboration tools, uh, like we've alluded to teams and, and zoom and these other items that, to, to, you know, keep us off the road some, I mean, that, you know, one of the things we talked about was, is, you know, the, the travel is you, sometimes you do got to go out and see and touch and, 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 and really be part of something when you're traveling, but traveling also, um, uses up some of our productivity. So we, we've actually seen by being off the road, um, and using these tools, we've seen our entire workforce productivity increase. Um, and it's also too to hey, we're maybe working more hours because we can, um, but we're also not traveling. And um, and so you know that's been an important impact to us. And I think this the, the whole digital economy side for us. You know, I mentioned you know us just launching our digital platform, but it's making us think about our future business model, especially in service. We are already thinking about it and transforming our service business. But it's it's really accelerating of the the art of what's possible in predictive maintenance and other things and the interactions with customers, and I you know so I I think there's going to be some good that comes out of it from that standpoint. Um, it'll help us maybe modernize our business faster. And I think Lee alluded to it that hey the the best I mean I I I spend a lot of time and effort in change management, but we, you know we've got more done in in a month than we could have in a year. Um, and across the organization. I mean, it's, it's hit our technicians. I mean, our technicians are now looking at the digital platforms um, a lot quicker and more open to it um, than otherwise. We would have had to spend tons and tons of money to convince them and, and to travel around and train them and retrain them, et cetera. Um, but the use cases we're seeing in our business are it's getting adopted qu quicker than we thought. Um, same with our customers. I mean, we saw a, a 200% increase in our online digital services last uh, in the last two months. So you know, we're, and, and we, we've been pushing it as a campaign, but we're not, we're not traveling to every customer and sitting in front face to face and giving them demos. We're showing it to them online and sharing it with them and, and, and they want it. 
And so that has changed how we're working. And I think it's a good thing. Yeah, I guess you know, this, I think this is a more interesting um, uh, a topic you, you're sort of transitioning us into, which is just uh, uh, surprising areas of opportunity that, that uh, have emerged. Uh, for your business, you know, as a result of, of having to retool and, and, and rethink and having a virtual workforce, like what's, uh, I think you alluded to it, but a little more detailed, Wayne, or, you know, around that, what, what are some things that uh, you're taking a look at uh, that you wouldn't have, uh, you know, uh, pre-pandemic? Um, I, I think we're looking at how we're going to use our data, you know, differently, maybe in a more integrated approach. How do we, hmm. How do we use our operations data and blend it with our, you know, financial and back office data to really give, you know, our leaders and our functions better insights? Um, You know, we've we've got lots and lots of data out there, but we don't bring it together into really concise, uh, easily to consume information that you can make fast decisions on. And I think we started we took some use cases during this pandemic out of necessity. And um, and 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 made something of it very quickly. And I think what we're seeing now is is it's really time to jump on the accelerator uh, on that on those kinds of things. And the business is open to it. Yeah. You know. So it's one thing to to get asked for something and then go through that process of clarifying and 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 building something and innovating. It's another process to you know you have your back against the wall a little bit, come up with something, improve it quickly. Um, and and then convince everybody that wow this is this is where we need to go right and just by doing it it's it's uh, that's been the best part of the change management and the support we're getting from a, from a, an IT function. Got it. Uh, what about uh, you, Lee? Uh, I, I know you had um, an interesting anecdote in a, in a prior conversation we had around um, early on in the crisis uh, something about uh, cleaning. I, I wonder if you could share that. About what? Uh, about uh, some of the uh, new services you were having to offer uh, at... Uh, oh, yeah. At, uh, One of the things that uh, we discovered early on was as our uh, commercial, some of our commercial business was the businesses were closing, uh, we also were uh, being asked about sanitation services and we ourselves had a branch location uh, that had had a positive COVID test, so we voluntarily shut it down and, and quarantined the uh, office staff there uh, and had to bring somebody in to sanitize it. We're having problems finding it, and we said, you know what, uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, disinfectant, sanitation-type uh, requirements coming out of this thing. Let's let's start doing that. And we set a real record for us. Within 15 days, we had sourced and acquired the product. Uh, we had to bring it in initially in 55 gallon drums to our headquarters here in Atlanta, and then have uh, our facilities team uh, transfer it to five gallon. Uh, uh, container so it could be shipped out to our branches. We had to acquire a different set of sprayers uh, and and uh, acquire hundreds of those so we could get the sprayers to the branches, uh, PPE gear, and then in our business, it's it's really important that uh, we our technicians be properly trained, uh, that we have all of the protocols and the steps identified that they are to follow. Uh, so we had training, training films made. So this was the executive steering committee meeting on a daily basis with the people responsible for all those different components that had to happen in order for us to uh, be able to offer this service. And, and in fact, even you know, coming up with a name, the marketing department coming up with marketing materials as to why this was good and the legal department making sure that uh, we didn't make any claims that somebody could come back later and say, no, it really doesn't do that. Uh, and and we, we did that in about 15 days. And within two weeks of launch, uh, we had sold over a million dollars worth. We had another $20 million out on proposal uh, to businesses wow. that were asking for proposals. They weren't yet open. Uh, so, I mean, that's a real success story. And we think 
We think that's something that long after COVID-19, I don't think this is going to be forgotten for years. So I think sanitation mm -hmm. services are something that people are always going to pay attention to. But, you know, when you talk about reinvention and are we going to come out of this better, uh, you know, a lot of people think that Charles Darwin said that, uh, you know, a species survival is survival of the strongest or survival of the fittest. And that is not what his theory was. His theory was that a species survival is dictated by its ability to change and adapt. And I think that, uh, you know, when we come out of this, some of our businesses are going to change drastically. Some will never be what they were. Take the airline industry, for example. Uh, I think Warren Buffett uh, had it, he was dead on when he got rid of all of his airline stock. Because if you think about what percent of an airline's business and revenue comes from business travelers, that mm. the amount of business travel that we were spending you know, with the airlines is never going to be the same. Uh, We've discovered we don't need to get on a plane every time we need to have a meeting. Uh, and then think about the ripple effect that all of the other smaller industries that you never think about that are dependent upon the airlines, the airline vendors now, that they're going to be impacted. And they better be able to change what they sell or who they sell to, uh, or they're not going to survive. Automobiles. Uh, you know, I've been going into the office every day. This is Atlanta. We're what? Top, always the top three for worst commute in the, in the country. And it has actually, actually been pleasant with everybody working from home. <laughs> and so, you know, the insurance companies have issued uh, credits, right? Because there's the, people aren't driving and there's, yeah. many, there's fewer accidents. So the insurance companies are issuing credits. People are not going to buy cars as often because we're going to have these this hoteling. We're going to have people working remotely. We're going to put less miles on cars. Uh, the rental car companies are one of the biggest people that are going to be whacked because, again, airline passengers down. I mean, you know, look at what's happening to Hertz and Avis today. I mean, they've got thousands, tens of thousands of rental cars parked uh, that, that uh, you know, nobody's renting and automotive repair shops and people who do oil changes. I mean, when you talk about the amount of change that's coming as a result of this, every business out there had better be looking at their customers, their model and their products and saying, okay, if, if this is the new normal, and some of it will be the new normal, um, you know, how, are we gonna, how are we going to adapt and how are we going to change in order to ensure our survival? Well said. Rusty, uh, uh, any sort of uh, surprising areas of opportunity that have emerged out of Corsicana? Yeah, you know, I, I love what Lee said. That To me, that's exciting, you know, that you guys pivoted instantly and, and, and um, discovered a new line of business, essentially. Uh, and really, that's that's kind of thing that we love. We, we dream about in IT, you know, just trying to be a part of something like that. You know, I think for us, um, uh, it's it's really I think created a lot more urgency um, internal. We've already been pivoting externally. Um, uh, whether they've got the um, funding to be able to shift, you know, I, th I think with more people working from home, we're going to see other things in the home uh, get a little bit more wear and tear, you know. And and uh, who knows? I mean, we you know we we specialize in you know, foam and springs and, and right now mattresses and some toppers, but who knows where else that'll go as, as uh, you know, chairs get less comfortable at home and things like that. Maybe there's a little pivot they can do there. But, um, you know, I think, and I love the phrase, Lee, that you, that you talk about adaptation. You know, we had a previous company, a president used to say, it's not the big who beat the small, it's the quick who beat the slow. And uh, I think now mm -hmm. uh, everyone's got to be ready to, to adapt and adapt quickly. And what we discovered uh, internally is that we still have areas that we've not yet gotten to. And those, those efforts were pulled off the plate uh, last year as we were really kind of uh, shifting and, and shrinking actually, and then figuring out what we need to do. But we've realized that all of the areas that we were not able to get to and really automate 
um, are still the things that are preventing us from being quicker and more nimble. And so they're getting a lot of attention now. I mentioned changing our order, the cash process, where we've got a ton of things in finance that are they just throw bodies at. Um, and uh, so I think there's going to be much more uh, uh, aggressive need to uh, to change that. And, and it's not even I'm not pushing water uphill anymore with it. You know, it's really going to be where we're getting drawn into that. So that that's kind of the biggest impact I see for us from a sense of urgency is that, you know, we've really got to um, got to get quicker uh, because I don't know where this pendulum is going to land. We, we know it's not going to go all the way back, like we said, uh, but but who knows what what consumers are going to want. And that's going to drive what retailers need to be. And we need to be out in front of that um uh you know to be to, to beat our competitors to it great mr davis uh any sort of uh surprising areas that have emerged uh in your opinion um surprising maybe not um, but what was interesting was we have an innovation group um, that's been testing uh new technologies new business models uh new ways of of just doing lots of things and and while they were funded and they were working along the way. Um, what's happened here is uh, this thing's accelerated a lot of that um, innovative work. For example, um, we've been dabbling around um, how do you do a, a, a code score, for example, of, of a Java programmer. The Java programmer can handle this line of code and what would they get their score on? You know, we kind of dabbled with that, um, but what we're, what, what's come out of it now is, is we're, gonna, we're gonna put together what we call a, K-Force approved candidate, and we'll have all the pieces and parts done, the background check, the, the codes uh, test, the the uh, the uh, video interview, um, all these other things, and have it ready to go, because we know that when it's when the upturn starts to happen, um, it's basically the first one that gets a good candidate to the hiring manager is going to win. So we need to be ready and prepared for that. So. Great. All right, we got some uh, questions coming in now. Uh, let me see if I can read these. Ah, uh, hey, hey John, Matt I've Gardner. got a question. Yeah, would that be okay? Oh, sure. Um, and yeah, of course. Then you 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 had mentioned hoteling, and then just open to anybody on the panel. Um, you, many years ago, I was with uh, Ernst and Young, and and we did hoteling there. So if you're going to be in the New York or the London office, you just program it into the you know register yourself as being in that location. And then when you got there, everything was prepared. Your name was on the office, your phone routed. Are you guys using any tools to facilitate this hoteling concept that you're looking at? Yeah, we are. We already have it live. Um, it's called Condeco. And uh, basically the way it works is either from your mobile phone or from your, you know, from the website, um, you pick up a, a layout of the entire office and it tells you which ones are open. Um, and you select yourself, and you, when you do that, you, it will reserve you from that time. So when you get to the office, uh, to prevent people from squatting, you have to scan your badge onto that that cube, and that cube will then say, okay, now it's released, right? Or now that person can 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 work on it. Um, and, and there's certain rules we put in there, like because uh, some some office cubes are better than the others. The ones that are by the window are bigger, and that sort of thing mm -hmm. like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, we we have a tool set that we we've actually used and rolled out uh, for the entire back office. That's awesome. Thanks. Great question. Um, all right, on to the audience questions here. Uh, let me, Matt Sargent out there, uh, and he has asked, uh, would anyone like to speculate as to the impact on availability and price of commercial real estate as many companies remain entirely or partially remote? Interesting question. That ties into a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah, I think that goes back to what I said earlier. I think that's one of the industries uh, that's going to be impacted the most. I was uh, reading the Wall Street Journal last night, and they were already talking about vacancy rates in San Francisco and New York City, and that how expensive uh, that office space was, and businesses were really taking a hard look at whether they needed to spend that much. Uh, one of the, the great things that I hope comes out of this is, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, we, we in the United States have evolved more to everything is happening. It's urban. It's in the cities. And that's where everybody wanted to be was in the cities. 
And we have so many, uh, you know, especially as over the over the years, manufacturing left. We have so many small towns that are just beautiful places to live, but there's, you know, there, there, there's no way to make a living there. And uh, mm -hmm. it, we've we've been very successful. We've uh, over the years, uh, if we've had very good employees, for instance, on our support desk, we've got three or four folks. Uh, whose spouses got a transfer and moved to another city, and we didn't want to lose them. So we said, you know, do you want to keep working for us? So, uh, you know, uh, much the same way we're routing all of our sales calls to uh, people's homes, uh, we're doing the same thing with our support desk. So we've got four or five people that don't live anywhere near Atlanta. Uh, well, why couldn't, uh, you know, if you wanted to to have a a house and work from Fairhope, Alabama, or Hilton Head, South Carolina, or all those places that would be beautiful to live uh, if, you, if you had a job, that's all going to be available now uh, to us. And I, yeah. think, I think commercial real estate, if I was in the commercial real estate business, I'd be really looking at how do we change our model and what do we need to be doing differently? Because I think I think that uh, the pendulum, when the pendulum swings back, it ain't going to swing all the way back for those guys. Mm. Yeah, I would think that's particularly yeah, right. uh, important for our business, obviously, in the elevator escalator business. But it'll um, we, we certainly, you know, we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, we've actually I mean, most construction projects that were financed or, or started or are ongoing. Um, but I think we will. I think we'll see certainly maybe lower, if nothing else, we're going to see lower density in, in office space for sure. Um, and that may result in just lower square footage overall. So we'll have to see how that plan tr uh, trend plays out. But um, I think we're anticipating that to some extent. Um, uh, but again, we'll, we'll continue to watch those signs uh, progress. You know, I've talked to a lot of uh, my, my fellow CIO here in Atlanta, a lot of them have said that over the last couple of years, they spent a lot of money remodeling their IT areas to the open model and just the very low cubicles. And of course, we, we haven't done that at Rollins. We're still the old six feet high, but right now it's like, wow, I'm so glad that we didn't do that, right? Because they're having to put up plexiglass and, and uh, you know, tape off areas on the floor, et cetera. So. Yeah, we're having to do the same thing, Lee. We uh, we 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 went to the hoteling model. We went to the open, collaborative spaces with whiteboards on the walls and all that kind of good stuff. And now, one of the things that's delaying us from from putting together a time frame of actually going back into the you know corporate office is how do you protect people with shields and supplies and you know especially in the hoteling model where it's not your desk every day. So yeah, that's. Uh... That, that's an issue. And I also worry about human nature as I think people like to nest, whether they're in a cubicle or an office, they like to have family pictures, they like to have, you know, things that are theirs that make them feel like they're, um, you know, in their place. And that's the other thing I worry about while telling is, you know, you don't really get the opportunity to do that. So Yeah, we, we, we ran into that. We ran definitely into that. When people had been there for 12 to 13 years in their same cubicle and they had, you know, awards and all trophies and all this other stuff and their kids pictures. And I mean, when we went to town, that was, you could tell that was a, that hurt yeah. them. I mean, they felt like they're not, you know, as part of the family anymore, I think. So. I guess you mm. carry it all around in a briefcase. And when you get there every morning, you open your briefcase and you set up all your awards. And your well, we, yeah, pictures. We, we, we could do that. What we did actually, uh, um, one of the things we did learn on the hotel and I know it's not part of it, but our discussion, but, um, we put in uh, lockers inside the uh, hallways and you could get, assign yourself a locker. And basically you didn't have to take your keyboard and mouse and everything home every day if you didn't want to, right? Um, you can you can just leave it there. So, so some people did, some people um, kept their family pictures in there and then when they would set up in the morning, they would just put the pictures around whatever desk they were at. So. Good, good. I have a question more. from the uh, audience. Uh, I, I, I'm sort of on this topic. Uh, this is from Jane Jenkins. Uh, her question is, uh, leadership is critical when leading change. Several mentions change management, including Dwayne. Uh, and she's curious what tips uh, the panelists can share when it comes to leading change. So Dwayne, we'll, we'll start out with you on that. 
Well, I mean, you know, we, you know, we use an ad car methodology, you know, here pretty much, but it's, it, you know, when we normally do change management, there's, there's a lot of early convincing that, that goes on. And, you know, what's in it for me is usually what we try to answer for the employees. And we also try to answer in it, what's in it for us as a company too. So there's a lot of convincing that has to go on and, and change management. It has to be well-prepared and the message well-received. The, the interesting thing about this pandemic is, is, you know, everybody's forced to change and, and, um, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. And so being out in front as a leader, um, we did a lot of communication with our employees. Um, you know, we were running uh, three crisis management team calls a day at three different levels of uh, leadership in the organization, you know, followed by constant communication, uh, webinars, uh, video conferences, those sort of thing to get the message out, to tell the employees, you know, you know, what's going on, what's going on in the business, what's going, what are we doing to protect the workforce, um, et cetera. So, you know, it, when, once you get past that, it's, it's really the leadership taking the effort to communicate and then over communicate. And I think that's part of what we did. I think that was successful, you know, in our organization. And, and then, you know, from a, if you look at technology, um, things just have to work, right? <laughs> so, um, and if, and if you're experimenting, then be honest and say, Hey, we're all in this pandemic together. We're going to try something new. Um, you know, let's pick some super users and other things and, and try it out together and, and keep that open communication. And so I think being honest in those communications is imp- just as important. So, Yeah, I would say yeah. that uh, it's communicate, 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 and you can't communicate too much or too often. It's, it's honesty, be honest, be honest, be honest. Uh, and then just as importantly, I, I think good leadership is servant leadership, and it's make sure you have empathy and truly recognize that, that people are scared. Uh, they all know somebody that has tested positive. They all know uh, multiple somebodies who've lost their job and, and have no income. Uh, they're all reading the news, and unfortunately, with three or four or five 24-7 news channels that aren't news anymore, they're opinion <laughs> channels, um, you know, they managed to, to just scare the hell out of everybody. And so you got to recognize that people are people are frightened. And so they've got to have confidence that their leadership um, may not have all the answers, but when they don't, they say so. And to Dwayne's point, we don't know if this is going to work, but we're going to try it, right? Uh because the important thing is do something because, you know, once you get it moving, it's a lot easier to change direction. But when you're, you know, frozen in place, uh, that that's bad news. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, we, we have a change management methodology from Connor Partners and uh, it, it's pretty rigid, um, but it works. And basically it's your you know, stakeholder and your enrollment piece and that sort of thing. Um, but for this, one in, in particular, this, this um, COVID issue that we had, um, communication was huge from the top, but what's also huge was they wanted, all the executives wanted to hear from the actual individuals themselves. So we did multiple surveys and multiple questions. And um, and what was interesting is, you know, we've all done a, a survey, an opinion survey, and then six months later, you get it back and say, this is what happened, right? Um, no, we turned it around in a, two days, right? So So people, the first time we had, you know, maybe 80 percent participation the second time unbelievably we had 95 percent participation on the survey because we turned it around in two days and said this is what we what we're hearing and this is what we're going to do about it so as we continue to do that and hear and, and react i think that's gaining a lot more trust yeah i think there's not a whole lot i can add to what my esteemed panelists have chimed in on but uh i i do think you know you you start with what Dwayne said you start with the why why behind every change and then i really think um uh, over communicating. I've learned the hard way many years ago that in the absence of information, misinformation flourishes. And so uh, over communicate. And then I like what Lee said about um, empathy, especially right now, because a lot of people are scared. You know, we went through some furloughs and, and salary reductions and things like that. And, and it's uh, um, hugely impactful. And, I, you know, one of the first actions we took back in, in uh, late March, early April uh, was a virtual happy hour. You know, we had never done that, you know, and I was kind of wondering in the midst of this bad news, doom and gloom, 
was this going to be more awkward than it was beneficial? Or were we just going to feel forced to stare at each other, you know, and then do it? And it was the opposite. And so, you know, I think that uh, it was really it, it, it surprised me not just how much they enjoyed it, but how much I enjoyed it. You know, and I, I think, you know, as the pendulum does swing, I love working from home and I, I love missing that commute in Dallas. And, and uh, uh, but I miss my FaceTime. I miss, you know, being with my team and being with peers and, and things like that. So, um, you know, I think we need to understand that aspect of human nature when it comes to change, because nobody, I'm a change, we're all change agents and I don't like change uh, when, when it impacts me. And uh, I think that um, it's, it can be more isolating and, and therefore harder if we're not together. And so I think finding new ways to reach out and going back to some of the old ways when we can uh, to be there and be uh, highly empathetic. Um, and I listen a lot, you know, cause I, I really, that's part of what my, my, happy hours, whatever you want to call them, are for is to really understand, okay, what are you guys feeling? And and I've, over time, earned my way to where they trust that it's a safe place to, to really just voice questions and drop something on the table that, that may be a little awkward. So uh, I welcome that. Great. We are uh, just shy of the hour, and I want to be conscious of, of, of everybody's time. Uh, I, I think this, this wraps uh, the, the panel component of our of our uh, day to day, I just uh, want to thank uh, Rusty Lee, Kevin, and Dwayne for uh, not only participating but bringing your A game, uh, which which is which is usual uh, with all of you. Really, you know, appreciate the insights and the uh, the candor you're sharing. And it's it. it uh, I, I've always said one of the most important things we CCG as a consultancy does is just bring our network together. Uh, you know, we, we learn from each other, we get energy and inspired from each other. And, and, the, and, you know, the hope is that there are nuggets, uh, you know, that were shared around change management, around the importance of analytics, around, uh, you know, data being, uh, so important. Uh, you know, many of the concepts that you've shared, uh, you know, that other people can, can take away and, and, and use in their own uh, professions. So with that, I will, uh, turn it over to Mr. Dan Rodriguez, who's uh, going to transition into our next uh, uh, section, which is all about uh, our two success stories, uh, with uh, first being with Vineyard Vines and Mr. Chris Fitzpatrick, uh, who's going to talk about the importance of aligning uh, inventory data with customer data to improve demand forecasting, a lot of, a lot of other things that are highly relevant right now in the, in the retail apparel space. And then Mr. Chris Laping. Uh, we'll follow, who's also going to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of using customer intelligence to really, uh, you know, drive and navigate, uh, uh, the, you know, this time of crisis. And with that, I'll uh, turn it over to you. Thanks, guys. Dan. Thanks, guys. Take care, guys. guys. It was fun. Thank you. Enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, enjoy it. Thank you, guys. All right. So, Mr. Fitzpatrick, are you with us? And can you hear me? There we go. Hey, Chris. Not too bad. Um, at this point, I can't hear you yet. You might be muted through GoToWebinar. Chris, it looks like you have to enter a PIN. Right, so I, yep, Here we I go. Can hear you. Great. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, how are you doing? Not too bad. Thanks so much for joining. Um, so Chris Fitzpatrick, Vice President of Business Analytics and Strategy at Vineyard Vines. Chris, why don't you start? Just uh, tell us a little bit about Vineyard Vines and um, what the VP of Analytics and Strategy means. Yeah, so Vineyard Vines, uh, we're roughly a 20 plus year old uh, retailer of uh, apparel and accessories. Uh, based out of Connecticut, um, we have roughly 100 doors, a little bit over 100 retail doors across the U.S., um, as well as a pretty robust e-commerce and wholesale business. Um, my my role at Vineyard Vines is it has a couple of different pillars to it. One is uh, data analytics and and the kind of the data science component of it rolls up into me. We have a kind of business strategy component to my, to my team where we're helping the executive team 
identify future trends and future opportunities, and then that parlays into business development, which is kind of a new aspect of our of my team's role to kind of marry the three things, right? Data and analytics kind of begets like where you go and how you get there, and then measuring how those things are performing as you move forward. Absolutely, and. From a background standpoint, so many folks uh, that we talk to and, and um, potentially people in this audience assume, you know, VP of analytics, you have a data science background, you came from a deep technical background, um, but that wasn't the path for you. So maybe you give it just a, a minute around kind of your background and how you ended up in analytics. Yeah, my background is probably a little bit strange for the roles that I'm in. I, I started out my career in, in finance and banking. Um, and I moved through that kind of uh, world, decided that I, want, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more tangible. Um, I didn't really particularly care for working in the banking industry where I couldn't really understand. You know, I wanted to touch and feel the product. So I, I transitioned and worked for Timberland for about eight years in various roles, um, finance to begin with. And I, then I moved into business strategy while I was there for a number of years. Um, I worked uh, on an SAP implementation, and I still have the scars to show that. Um, and I, uh, then I worked for the, our, our head of product for a number of years. So I sat in the merchandising and uh, design worlds, helping them understand their business and, and trends. And then um, about seven years ago, moved over to Vineyard Vines, um, working in a financial role, um, more of an FP&A perspective now on the accounting side. And that background, I think, gave me a lot of visibility to where all the different kind of tranches and, and buckets of data sat in the business and w how siloed some of the information was. And it also gave me a sense of the different challenges across the business, whether it be commercially within our different pillars of our business or the back of the house and being able to tie those things together and understand where there are opportunities to integrate analytics into our business and data to kind of democratize data across the business. So, everybody was working off the same information, but also could look at it in different ways that were most applicable to the way that they needed to use the information. Um, and that's what we've been working on for the past two years um, and, and seen uh, quite a bit of success over the last six months or so as we've kind of scaled and brought more people into the loop. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's such a, a great talking point, um, the background, because you, know, you and I have talked offline multiple times about the value of understanding um, how to leverage analytics and how to apply them in the business. So I always think it's incredible, um, your background, and, and you do a really good job of that. So today we've talked a little bit about, you know, kind of the, the different strategic imperatives and, and the different ways that uh, companies have been dealing with the crisis, um, obviously the initial reaction and then starting to, to plan out the recovery. And, you know, we've been working for a couple of years together to, to start building muscle around um, getting those insights and getting accessibility to the business. Uh, I love the way you said it, democratizing um, data. Um, and we've brought in internal data, of course, and, and we've utilized external data. But as you're looking at recovery um, at Vineyard Vines and new seasons ahead, what are ways that you're particularly focusing on leveraging data today? Yeah, I, I think for one, it, when we walked into the, the COVID-19 crisis, you know, you're quickly looking at, I think one of your panelists, Dwayne mentioned like cash, cash preservation, right? Like inventory to us is our single biggest use of cash in a given year and using that in a way that's most effective to drive the business, but at the same token, at the same time, controlling that, that, that cash outlay because we have to become more productive because this does not as much cash coming in, right? We have 100 plus doors that are closed right now. Um, you know, they've been closed for multiple months. They drive a significant amount of revenue and in cash flow. Our wholesale partners are also all closed because their brick and mortar doors are, are closed. So that's a significant cash cash flow to our business. Um, so, you know, that became an imperative to really understand inventory, what we owned currently, right? What, what, what's, what's the liability we have potentially? And, and how do we move through that inventory in a way that's most beneficial to the brand for from a margin perspective, but also from a brand perspective, because you don't want to dilute yourself by just marking things down really heavily. And then looking out into the future and saying, okay, well, what was the intent of the upcoming seasons? What were we buying? What was the, what did the line look like? What do we absolutely need to drive the business? And what are the things that are most important to our consumers, right? Like, so we, 
we had to take a step back and look at that inventory position and say, you know, our customers gravitate towards these products. So we need these for sure. Some of these other things, like which ones are most important to us and which other things are most bullish about so that we could formulate a plan and, a, and an interesting story around the product because we don't want it to be a commodity and it's just a shirt. We need to tell, we are storytellers at the end of the day. And so there's a balance there between, you know, just pulling back entirely and suffocating your brand at the same time, investing in things that can help you drive the business and use that inventory wisely. Does that kind of get to your answer? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot in there. Um, you know, the, the different layers that you just spoke through and kind of getting that visibility um, is not one platform. It's not one source system of data. There, there's a lot going on in there. So talk a little bit more about um, what are the big areas of data that were so important for you to have that visibility and um, maybe contrast it with things you were able to do today that you weren't able to do a couple of years ago? Yeah, so one of those being is just looking at peak selling periods in our year right? and understanding, you know, back to school and holiday and those points in the summer that are really important to us, like Father's Day, those peak periods. And historically, we we were able to kind of see you know, the, the revenue trends in there. We could see what we sold, um, but we couldn't actually marry that up with our, our customer and our consumer and understand like, well, who, who was gravitating to those products and who was buying those at those points in time of the year? And what, were the, what was the value of that consumer to our whole brand? Um, so we're using the, the data today to look at the intersection of both those things, right? We're looking at the financial impacts of some of the things we're, we're doing. We're looking at the consumer who gravitated towards it historically and we're saying, okay, well, these are the products they bought. This is this is how valuable they are they are to the brand. This is how often they shop. So if I brought a consumer in on Father's Day, do they come back at back to school and holiday, or do they just come in and shop that one time? All right. Well, if I'm going to balance, I have one. I, I have to choose between a certain product. I'm going to choose the products that are going to gravitate towards that person that comes back multiple times in a given year. And through the data, we can we can see those things now. Right? We can we can help our planning and merchandising teams look at the business and, and say, okay, yeah, I know you guys really love this particular garment, but there was really only one consumer that shopped it last year and they really weren't that valuable to us. Whereas these garments or these items that you put into the line last year really resonated and we saw people come back multiple times throughout the year and there was something to those products. There was a hook to them that brought them into the brand and, and retained them or acquired new people. Um, so that's a couple of one of the ways that we're using the information to really understand those big peak selling periods that we're coming up on going into this year to make sure that we're protecting the business and driving value, but also making sure we're not disappointing customers. Um, we're, you know, lucky to a degree where we, we the customer base that we service, you know, they, they tend to be in the upper income brackets. They tend to be a little bit more um protected at, at this point anyway, it seems, from a lot of what's going on in the market. So that's helped us kind of get through the last couple of months. And, and we continue to drive a pretty significant amount of value to our e-com business. And part of that is knowing who our consumer is and being able to talk to them in a way and say, hey, these are the products we know you love. We're keeping them in the brand and hey, and we're and we're promoting them a little bit to get them to come back in. Yeah, it's so incredible. Um, both aspects of that because it's so common now for companies to talk about being customer centric, especially in retail. Um, and I think most folks think of marketing and customer service uh, when they think of customer centric. And obviously the last example you gave of being able to understand customers and, and um, which products are meaningful to them and kind of their behaviors and, and ways to personalize has influenced your ability to use the e-com channel. But I don't know how many people are laying um, customer information into those merchandising and planning conversations or into their um, the way they look at inventory or some of their supply chain um, components. So has that been a shift that was well received or, did, or was there a change component um, on your side to kind of introduce customer conversations into those teams? It was, it's changed over the last couple of years and it's really been driven by our president, um, Mike Gomer. I think, he, you know, he's been with the brand for it's uh, pretty much from, since the inception. And as a smaller brand over, over the years, it's pretty easy to get your hands around, right? You can, you can see what's happening in the business. You can 
somewhat, you know, go out to the stores and understand what the consumers resonate, what's resonating with the consumer. But as we've gotten bigger and we've grown pretty significantly, particularly over the last five years, your visibility to what's impacting the business changes and it becomes more difficult. And he was naturally looking for ways to understand what was going on, not just in the, the Fairfield County area of the business, but what's going on in, in St. Louis, what's going on in California and places that he couldn't get to day to day, week to week. And wanting to understand like what are, what are the different dynamics at play in each one of those markets and, and how is the consumer different and what are they buying and what are they not? So he could inform his decision making better and challenge our executive team also when looking at the data and, and comparing it against what he's being told, it gave him the power to drive the business a bit more. And he's been you know instrumental in driving that discussion across the business. And within our organization, it, you know, generally if, if you're if your president's on board, then everybody else has to kind of fall in line. And he's been driving a lot of that engagement. It's taken time, and it, it's it's not a natural thing. You, you have to take into consideration the apparel and footwear world has traditionally been more art than science, right? It's it's probably been like driven by design and and fashion and and in that art view of the world. And over the last five six years, you're seeing it kind of start to transition where you know there is more science being integrated to it, and you're seeing designers and merchandisers slowly gravitate that way to want to integrate how they think about the consumer and their products with a little bit of data, not all of it, but enough of it that can like inform some of their decisions and also reward them when they do well, right? If I'm a designer and I create this garment and it sells well, and I now can see that where traditionally no one ever even told me how it performed, that's also a positive thing. And it helps them understand, oh, well, you know, when I designed that, I was thinking about this. What other things am I thinking about in future seasons where I can extrapolate on that? Because it obviously gravitated, the customer obviously gravitated towards it. Absolutely. And I think um, it, it's fascinating insight. And it's a really good point to resurface or focus on, which is once executive leadership starts driving the business through data and through insights, then it naturally creates momentum, right? It builds up that inertia because um people you know at vineyard we had scenarios where people were saying what is he looking at and i want access to that because mm -hmm. i want to understand you know what he's now uh the way he's talking about the business i want to have access to those same things so it created this immediate desire for the way we're looking at the business now um and fortunately that was pre-pandemic and so mm -hmm. i'm interested you know, from a, a theme that we heard earlier amongst the panelists were that this create, the crisis has created this um, maturity or this focus that has kind of leapfrogged things that might have taken a year to execute on, whether it be innovation or whether it be adoption or change. Have you seen similar things as you're looking at uh, inventory demand forecasting, as you're looking at some of these components, knowing that a lot of the data um, you were presenting or that you were using was newer as far as being able to stitch all of it together and see the whole life cycle. How was that uh, focus or, and do you feel like there was an increase in performance from an adoption standpoint? There certainly has been and there's just been a, a need across our businesses to have more data available to them so they can make quicker decisions. I mean, every minute of every day right now, you're making some pretty significant decisions that can have, you know, long life impacts on, on the business in totality. And our teams, you know, they, as we walked into 2020, they're already, you know, kind of stepping into this world and they were really kind of getting more and more comfortable with it. But as they're being forced to make decisions in a, in a somewhat of a real-time manner, having the information at your fingertips that you can consume in a way that draws your eye to what those things that matter allows them to concentrate on the decision-making and not on getting at the information. And traditionally, it had been the other way. They'd spend 80% of their time trying to get at data, and then you're quickly reviewing it and, and kind of making a gut decision to a degree because you didn't really have the, the amount of time you needed to analyze and understand what, what the dynamics of the information today we're pivoting more towards a it's being served up to a degree 
they can ask that first question, but they can also go down to the second, third, and fourth questions that they had naturally, but they couldn't answer before. Um, and one of the benefits that I have as a, for my team is I have a, a number of people on my team who are, 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 are quite good at laying out information, quite good at listening to the business and the questions they have, interpreting those questions, and then putting data into an environment and in a format that they can consume it, thinking about the question they asked, but also thinking about the three or four questions that they might have thought about if they had seen the first answer. Um, so the combination of those two things have helped us really kind of push this forward really in a quick manner. And, and our teams have evolved really fast. I've been really impressed by our teams and the way that they're um, evolving the way they think about the business and, and making decisions um, over the last couple of months. It's just been, you know, as challenging as the environment's in, you're seeing like all these people and in, in, in processes and the business kind of evolve in, in real time, which has been interesting. That is very interesting. Um, you know, as you're looking at these different data points and as you're essentially writing the story that you're trying to tell or, or stitching it together so that you can drill down those different layers, um, how are you dealing with the fact that historical data, looking at you know same, same uh, sales year over year or looking at anything prior to the pandemic becomes mostly irrelevant how have you adapted kind of the performance management side to understand, well, how do we utilize any historical data in this? I think we're using it to a degree, but we're also, you know, what we're considering historical, the the, the window is a lot tighter. You know, like we're, we're looking at how, what performed last month and two months ago while we were in this environment and saying, okay, you know, like that did pretty well. What, why did that perform well? Because it, it's so unique. We, we, we've been lucky in the sense that we've had a couple of days in the last month where, where they rivaled Black Friday online, which is kind of insane to think about. But so many people have matriculated over to our website and to our econ business that, you know, we're just seeing a pretty significant amount of volume there. So it is, it's challenging. We're using that historical data right now to look out into the future to understand how different promotions may have performed during the holiday season and who resonated towards those, and then comparing, contrasting it against, okay, well, what are we seeing right now? Is that dramatically different? You know, is there something unique about right now that we should take into consideration as we think about, you know, back to school and, and the holiday periods? Because there are there are some dichotomies there where you're seeing people matriculate to certain product categories, right? So right now, you know, comfort's obviously huge. For a fashion brand, it's a pretty big deal, right? All of a sudden, people are pivoting away from buying, you know, more traditional business casual clothes to things like I have on, like a quarter zip or like something lightweight, or the materials that you're even choosing are very, very different than what you might have chosen going into the office. Hmm. Well, how does that look when you look out into the future and what you were buying and designing? Can you adapt that? Do you evolve it? Do you change it? You know, like is what how are fashion trends going to evolve coming out of the other side of this? And I suspect in what I'm reading and what I see in our own business is that fashion is going to change pretty dramatically. You know, you're already seeing this matriculation over to um, athleisure just more generally in, in products. And, and this is just a kind of accelerating that. And the fabrics you choose and the designs you choose are going to matter even more as you come out of the other side of this because people are going to look for products that they can wear at home because a lot more people are going to be working from home for a longer period of time. Even, even if they don't need to, they're going to want to. Right. Yeah, that's fascinating. And so as you're taking those um, insights or as you're taking those hypotheses, with so much disruption from a supply chain side, um, how do you go about looking back into your supply chain and thinking what decisions are being impacted on the way you do make buys or which products are selecting? Maybe talk a little bit about how you're utilizing this um, buying behavior and the change in, in landscape to influence the way you're looking at buying? Yeah, I mean, our, our merchandising and planning teams are working really, really closely together to, to understand the complexion of the line. What, what was the intent of the line going in? What are the things that we know are happening in the business right now? Okay, well, these particular categories are becoming more important. Can we buy more deeply into these particular categories of products? Because we think there's a greater opportunity here than maybe we did six months ago when we were are, like thinking about the line, and then where are those products that just don't really make much sense anymore? And 
do we keep them in the line? Is there is there a need for them to to live? You know, is there an is there an intent for them to live? And it, does it do something for the brand that adds value? Whether it's it's more of a premium play and it's more of an a marketing showpiece that you can storytell around that that is tied to some of the other products that we're we're planning on doing more volume on. Um, one particular area of the business that's really kind of fascinating to me right now is. In 2019, we took a lot of, we placed a lot of emphasis on our, our female consumer and understanding her better and how she shopped. And our merchants and designers and planners have been building out the line and really evolving the women's business and the products that we were building for her and trying to, you know, think about her more directly. And our, our teams were starting to see some really broad successes in what they were doing as they walked into holiday in the first couple of months of this year. And we don't want to lose sight of that, right? There was something there that was working and we were seeing green shoots in the business and, and the women's performance and, and the things that they were doing that were working well. And it's like, you don't, you can't just walk away from those because there was something there that the female consumer was gravitating towards. And it's easy to pivot quickly and say, well, she's buying all this stuff right now. Well, true, but she was also appreciating some of the other garments that we were putting into the market. And let's continue to keep those alive to make sure that we like let them grow and, and sprout, you know, because some of these things that we, we try are very small, right? Like, and that's what, where data helps a lot too. The things that are all going to rise to the top of a large program to drive a ton of volume, they're going to always be at the top of the report. Well, a lot of times you miss is those smaller items that you've tested or are playing with that perform really, really well, but because they don't drive the volume, they don't get the, the, the kind of, the, they don't get the visibility that they deserve. Having that data available to us and being able to look at that in a more in a clearer way and say, hey, yeah, this program, like there's a, a program that we're running called Dream Cloth, which is a perfect, it's a product that's very, the quality of the product is really, really soft and comfortable. And it wasn't a huge program to begin with, and you wouldn't really have picked up on it. But the consumer was gravitating towards it. We were acquiring customers through it. We were retaining, bringing back people into the brand. So females who hadn't bought the product in two years were coming back and buying that particular product. Now, the volume was small, but the, the impact it was having on how we were acquiring and retaining people was huge. So it's like that visibility is really how we're thinking about the remainder of this year and going forward and using data to help inform those things. Yeah, those are incredible stories and, and incredible insights. Um, there's so many aspects there that you touched on from forecasting to planning to production um, and, and uh, the full gamut across a channel that is now your primary channel, but also as you guys look to recover and get back into um, obviously the retail stores and the wholesale stores, uh, hopefully soon here. So uh, incredible insights there. Thank you so much. As kind of a, a closing statement, um, do you have any recommendations for folks in the audience as they're maybe not as far along in having a platform that, that gives them access to this data or to these insights? Um, or maybe just something that the pandemic has kind of raised at Vineyard Vines that you've taken away. Is there is there a nugget that you could offer to the team as maybe support or or something informative? Um, I think one of the things that I've learned the most is that it's really important to listen to the business community and listen to the end user and understand the way that they work. Because you can, you can build dashboards all day long and you can roll up data all day long, but if you don't understand the way that they operate and consume the information and the business decisions they're trying to make, you, you many times are, may present them something that they just can't use, right? And, and that appreciation, engaging with them, understanding their, their challenges, thinking through the challenges with them, and then presenting them something in an agile way that they can iterate on and feel like they have ownership of. I think has been really beneficial to us. We've been able to adapt and, and pivot and move and, and, and they feel bought in, right? And, and historically, at least in my experience, I've seen a lot of things just pushed down to business, the businesses. This is what you're going to see. This is the reporting you're getting. And that many times doesn't answer the questions that they have. And when the business is changing this much, this often right now, that approach is not going to work. It has to be iterative and, and very fluid. Um, Otherwise, you just you'll end up building things that don't matter, and the, and you'll lose people. They'll just drop off, and they'll go do their own thing, in a very siloed way. Absolutely. All right, great insight, great time. Thank you so much, Chris, for jumping on this morning, and uh, hope you have a fantastic day. Appreciate it, bud. Yeah. yeah. Bye. All right. Um, our next guest is Mr. Chris Laping pretty easy for me today. I have two Chris's. Hey, Chris. 
I believe um, you might be on mute with GoTo. Okay, there you're coming back on now. There you go. Always technically inept. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, well, we've had no share of challenges today, as always. But you know, the theme is adapt, so we're we're just putting it into motion with every every new speaker. Um, so I know you're on Mountain Time, so it's super early for you, um, as many others potentially listening here. So thank you so much for jumping on. Um, Chris Laping, Chief Innovation Officer at Bagel Brands and best-selling author of People Before Things. So tell me a little bit about uh, Bagel Brands, for those who may not know uh, kind of the concepts underneath, but also what Innovation Officer means. So uh, we're four brands, uh, and one of the brands is a national brand, Einstein Brothers Bagels. I think that's the one that people tend to know most. Uh, we have a regional brand in California called Noah's Bagels. Uh, and then we have a super regional brand in the Northeast called Brugger's. Uh, Brugger's does have some reach throughout the U.S., but it's mostly con concentrated in the Northeast. And then finally, we have a brand called Manhattan Bagels. So we're basically everything fresh baked bagels. Yeah. Uh, Chief Innovation Officer is a super fancy title. Um, in generally in the restaurant space, uh, the phrase innovation is reserved for food innovation. So a lot of times there's confusion when I meet strangers uh, in the business about what I do. But I would say, in essence, my focus is experience of the future. Uh, we have a business today. Uh, it looks a certain way. And we know that uh, the consumer is taking us in a different direction for the next five or 10 years. And so um, the core uh, part of my job is just answering the question, what does this thing look like five or 10 years from now? And of course, with COVID, uh, that has been greatly accelerated uh, in two months. Absolutely. And before we dive in um, into some of your experience throughout this this piece, I did want to tie in, you know, it's interesting when you, when you look at your bio that you have a strong technical background. You've been a lot of technical leadership roles, um, your title uh, as innovation officer, but you've also written a, a book titled People Before Things. So I thought it might be interesting if you could just give 30 seconds of what is the concept of that book and, and why you think it applies in, in, to your career? Well, I wrote the book because um, at that point when I sat down to, to author it, I had been in the IT space for 25 years. And what I came to learn during that time is that um, it really wasn't uh, the technology that was getting in the way of my teams and their success. It really was more a product of change leadership and how do you bring people together in an organization? How do you get them on the same page? And then once they're on the same page, how do you carry that momentum into change and transformation? It, because it certainly doesn't, it's not something that comes easily to um, organizations or for us in our personal lives. Uh, when I wrote the book, the other thing I really wanted to do um, was provide something to IT leaders that was coming from someone who was working with them in the industry. Um, everything I had been reading up until that point had been from people that were studying us. Um, and so we were like lab rats running around doing these things in these controlled experiments and people were writing books. But every time I read the book, um, I had a hard time finding my story in those stories. So um, I wanted a book that was full of storytelling. I wanted it to be fun. I wanted it to be an easy read. But I really wanted it to get to the essence of the work we have to do. Uh, and day to day as IT leaders, which is, again, we have a very unique position in our organizations where we get to bring people from multiple functions together. And how do we leverage that platform of bringing people together to do something really, really special? Uh, and so that was the goal uh, of the book. And, um, you know, truth be told, I needed a, a break when I went to go write it. I didn't know what to expect from it. I wasn't sure if it would sell or not. Um, I was fine that it didn't. And it just ended up leading me on a three-year journey where I was really um, fortunate to meet thousands and thousands of IT leaders across the country. Absolutely. And um, 
for those in the audience who may not know, uh, Chris and I will be talking on Friday um, about uh, change leadership in crisis, which is obviously something he's passionate about. I'm extremely, extremely knowledgeable on, so I'm super excited about that. But diving into today's topic, um, so we we teed it up with innovation, and you know we've been talking today about uh, kind of the different strategic aspects of dealing with crisis um, and, and the different phases of it. And so um, I know you have a great story that I'd like to share with the audience today around how you've been able to utilize um, customer information, buying behaviors, direct feedback, um, just general intelligence around your customer base to effectively innovate and um, develop an entirely new channel um, in a short amount of time. So I'd love to hear that story. Well, I mean, I think life um, in, in its best story uh, is when we combine uh, hard work with good luck. And we actually had some good luck. We had been doing work with you guys um, back in September. And I, I can't imagine where we would be right now had we not been uh, doing that with you and starting to really just take inventory of all of the great isolated islands of information we had in the organization and, and what would it be like if we could bring those things together. Um, and I think we got lucky because we were thinking about experience of the future and we we're already working on uh, our digital agenda. Now, uh, we, are way be, we were way behind the ball on our digital agenda. And so this was all about like, how do we catch up to where we should be with the market but how do we just, again, anticipate where things are going in the future and build something that's compelling, um, that represents more what people want five to 10 years from now than, than just right now? And so all of that work was building, and we had an agenda for this year to really do a lot of that work. And what happened in this crisis was we had to accelerate uh, a, you know, a one year's worth of work into three or four weeks. And our goal and focus with digital was like, how do you roll out the minimal lovable product? Um, like we, we can't uh, uh, impede our progress because we're so focused on perfection. Um, and at the same time, if this is not a useful tool to our guests, then um, we, we're going to have nothing. And so uh, that's what we did. We just set out uh, in a rapid format to um, get something in the hands of our guests. Again, we had planned to do this over a course of a year. And we knew that if we got it done in the year and 5% of our total sales came to the digital channel, then we were winning. That was what we were hoping for. That, you know, in December 31st, as I looked back on 2020, I would say, we did a good job because we got these digital um, tools in the hands of our, our consumers, and we have 5% of our total sales coming through those channels. Uh, what happened was we got it done in three to four weeks, and it's been as high as 25% of our total sales. Um, wow. So again, I don't know where we would be right now had some of this work uh, not been happening. And that if we had not uh, been back in September, again, starting to rationalize, what do we have here from an information perspective that we could then quickly read and react to what was going on in the market, uh, I, think we'd be, I think we'd be in real trouble right now. Absolutely. What an incredible um, result. So, you know, a part of having uh, customer intelligence is obviously understanding um, behaviors of your customers, what their intent is. Um, but I know you also blended in actual feedback directly from the customers. Um, what did you learn from your customer base early on in the crisis? We learned all kinds of amazing insights. Like these are the kinds of things that when you say them out loud, they don't feel like um, anything that is you know, that intelligent or smart or like, wow, that's really your discovery. But the reality of it is these were big discoveries for us. And one thing I've learned in the restaurant industry is that the business is all about simple, um, but simple is really hard. So how do you do the simple things really well? And how do you notice the simple things that your guests are saying um, and, and react to them? 
So um, one of the things that we picked up pretty early stage uh, from guest feedback is that people in general weren't scared to walk into a restaurant per se. Now, and I'm not talking about a sit down restaurant where you're going to have table service and, you know, you've got loads of guests around you. I'm talking about our model is a fast casual model where you go in and you order, you wait a couple of minutes and you take your food and run. Um, but, so they weren't saying that they were scared to be in the store, but what we were picking up on was that families, uh, people, they were concerned about the actual handling and preparation of the food. So, you know, taking that insight, what we really processed quickly was, well, how do we create a concept of more of a meal kit where people can take something that's partially done and take it home and prepare it the rest of the way to help create safety? The, the other nuance that was going on, and I think we probably can all relate to this on some level, is that meal planning all of a sudden was getting flipped on its head. And people weren't just thinking about one meal. It was like, my goodness, how do I take care of breakfast for the week? Um, and I, I, you know, let, let's say in our case, we have a lot of guests that have children. You, like, you feel guilty about buying a box of cinnamon toast crunch and putting it down on the table every morning for breakfast. So it's like, what can I do to, to spread out the week? So again, it doesn't seem like an amazing insight, but it was a nuance that we were able to pick up that, um, hey, people want to be able to just take the food the rest of the way. So we rolled out a cookie kit and people could um, buy this cookie dough and go home and easily bake cookies. Another um, example is uh, we made pizza bagels. And so people with kids were um, buying the pizza bagels where the kids could put all of the ingredients on the, on the uh, bagel and then they could bake it like a pizza. And you killed two birds with one stone. You you fed um, the family and you occupied uh, your children's time for a little while. Um, so these are the kinds of things. Um, I would say there's probably five to six other really big insights we were picking up along the way that we had to be prepared to just completely accelerate into and just go for it and um, be able to measure quickly. You know how are how are the consumers feeling about this? Absolutely. There's so many um, interesting nuggets in there. You know, we, we've heard multiple times throughout the day, um, our last speaker spoke to it, and, and I think you just raised it also, which is a good analytics platform with good um, analysts are able to pick up those signals from the noise. And even those, uh, those signals may seem and appear very simple. Um, when there's a lot of noise, they get lost. And those simple signals can um, encourage people to align behind them and really execute, which is obviously the leadership's role is, is picking the signals that are very interesting and then aligning everyone behind that. So, so I think that's mm -hmm. um, that's a common theme that we've heard all day today and something that that's interesting to call out is really those, it doesn't have to be, holy cow, innovation is we've thought of something no one's ever thought of on the planet and we're going to change the way people eat. Um, it can be, we're going to deliver them in the way they need it today with the least amount of friction. And that is innovation just because you're delivering it in a way that, that others cannot. Um, that's right. So that's really interesting. Um, and I love the fact that, that those signals came out and you teased out at the end, um, the first part of innovation there was figuring out what you want to do uh, within the digital channel and the way you want to change your product line. And then obviously very rapidly executing against it. But at the end, you teased out the last piece of that, which is then being able to manage performance against it. Um, so talk a little bit about that. And were they traditional dashboards that you had been using before to manage performance? Or was this a, a new view into the business that um, you kind of had to create on the fly? That was a... That was a wise question uh, that, that Yoda would ask. Uh, <laughs> it probably took us three days to realize that a lot of the key metrics that we were looking at in the business were just not appropriate for this environment. If I give like one simple example of that, if you think about retail, one of the metrics that everybody hangs their hat on is year over year sales performance. 
And they use that to measure the health of their business. If they're a public company, they talk about it to their shareholders and people either get excited about it or they get scared and they sell their stock. Um, year over year is completely irrelevant in this environment. Um, and it almost feels more like a startup environment where you're really living the world of week over week. What happened this week compared to last week? Are we showing growth and progress? Um, all the way to, okay, we have a special initiative around meal kits. How do we measure the success of these meal kits? Um, on a normal day, we might just look at the number of units sold and the percentage of that product being sold compared to all the other products being sold. And uh, that in the, you know, in our, in the retail world, that's called mix. And if the mix um, doesn't show significant um, uh, interest around a product, if people aren't buying it as much percentually, you, you walk away from it. Um, we had to be prepared to uh, measure other dimensions of this. Um, because again, if you think about the concept of a meal kit or bulk bagels, right? You buy your bagels for the week. Now we're changing the behavior, right? We were winning before if you came in every morning and had a bagel with schmear and a cup of coffee, um, which, which you may not have been like winning in the waistline, but we would have been winning in, if you were showing up every day. But if I'm pushing you to bulk bagels, if I'm telling you, you know, bagels are a great product to, to actually freeze. Um, uh, or think about if you get these bulk bagels, it's going to be something your family is going to enjoy for the week. Well, then, then that means you're not going to be coming in every day. And we had to be prepared to look for that. Um, and we just had to, again, from a, a, a performance metrics perspective, had to be uh, able to start identifying the things that mattered the most to our guests, especially with digital. Accuracy and timeliness is really important. Um, most people are using those channels because they are trying to skip the line. So when you order your food and you're going to pick it up, you expect when you walk in that it's there. And by the way, you expect that it's accurate, um, that the, what you ordered is in the bag. Um, then you layer on top of that, well, there's a contactless component to this now. Uh, and people want to touch as few things as possible when they're in the store. And so how do you measure that? How do you measure that you're winning in that area? And these were all of the questions that we had to work through and we still are working through and still trying to make sense of. Um, it, again, simple is hard. Our business is extremely simple, but in many ways, picking up the patterns and the overall messages of consumers is hard. And you, for us, we could not during this time carry the mindset that the traditional metrics were going to help us pick up those signals. Um, and, and in fact, they were going to create a bunch of noise and we could look at things like um, even customer service metrics, the surveys that people fill out. And for whatever reason, in, in during the crisis, that you know reasons I can't really explain, uh, our guests are giving us like ten point better scores. Hmm. And we've literally sat around and said, "Well, is this just because people, the people that do respond, they're just so grateful that something's open?" Is it because people are just like so crushed by this crisis that they want to reach out and just say something nice? But when your scores go up that much, that traditional metric of looking at them, you have to really evaluate, am I getting a good read? Are the consumers really overwhelmingly happy? I'm getting 10 point better scores, but the fact of the matter is we're down 30, 40, 50% in sales. Um, how do you reconcile those two things? So long answer to your question, Dan, but I think your question is spot on. Um, the, the metrics that got us here are not the metrics that are going to help us move through this crisis. Absolutely. And I think it's so interesting because, you know, we've talked about agility today. We've talked about access and accessibility to, to information. And so many of the things that you're speaking to that are real life scenarios at Bagel Brands, um, don't happen if it takes you two weeks to put together a report to figure something out. I mean, you just yes. don't have the bandwidth and a two month crisis, 
you don't have a month or, or even a week to put together information. Um, and I love you the know, startup it, analogy. To, you, to build on that too, it's like, even if you just think about the human behavior component, which we talked on a little bit about um, earlier in our discussion, in, in human behavior, when you reflect back on something you did six months ago, you don't always have really good clarity on what happened. You don't remember it correctly. Um, if something happened a week ago, you don't really remember it very well. And in some cases, something happened just yesterday. And so if you're trying to improve yourself as a person, you can't do it if you're doing these look backs that are far in the process. That instead, that where you get really um, big change and transformation in your life is when you catch it in the moment. Like in the moment, you go, oh, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm behaving. And it's just like that with a business that if everything we build is looking at a business that happened six months ago and there's that natural lag, uh, that is not going to be helpful in a crisis that uh, we have to, in the moment, catch it. What's happening here? What are guests telling us? What do our communities need from us? What do our team members need from us? That requires reading and reacting in the moment. And a lot, of, a lot of our businesses are just not wired to do that. I know our business um, is still not wired to do that fully, uh, but it's something that I would think we aspire to. Absolutely. Well, Chris, um, I always enjoy our conversations. They always seem to go faster than, than I expected them to. And there's so many uh, more topics I'd love to get into. I know we're going to talk more about change on Friday. Um, but but I'll close with the same question that I asked Chris Fitzpatrick is, you know, there's so many incredible things that you've learned through this crisis, uh, or at least that you've executed on in the crisis. So um, for those who maybe are, are going through something that you went through last week, last month, et cetera, or for those maybe preparing for, um, God forbid, the next crisis, uh, do you have any advice for the audience? Uh, I read uh, a great book, so I'm going to do a book recommendation uh, called Atomic Habits it's by James Clear. And um, the whole point of the book is that our lives don't change, our businesses don't change because of these big breakthrough moments. Um, they happen as a result of little things that we do along the way. And I love the way he frames it. He basically says, we don't rise to the level of our goals, we fall to the level of our systems. And so um, he gives a quick story in the beginning of the book. Jumbo Jet takes off from Los Angeles going to New York. It takes a slight turn to the south, three and a half degree turn, um, which is basically seven feet. Uh, and if you were on a jumbo jet, you would never feel the seven foot turn. And that one turn, instead of landing in New York City, you land in Washington, D.C., and the point of his story is it's all about trajectory um, and trajectory can dramatically change with the smallest tweak. So I think the piece of advice I would give, um, especially if I were giving it to myself back in June or July before we started doing work with you, the advice I would have given to myself was, would be just jump in. The small things matter. Start building these conversations with the teams around information that matters and information that doesn't and just start building stuff um, and and uh, making those incremental improvements along the way could uh, make a huge difference later. Fantastic advice. We've got innovation, human behavior, um, small <laughs> tweaks to, to drive. On Friday, we'll be talking results. about psychology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks so much, Chris. I really appreciate your time, and um, I look forward to talking to you soon uh, around change leadership. All right, over to again. Mr. Yeah, take care, Chris. Over to Mr. Brian Rhymes to wrap us up. Thank you, Dan. I uh, definitely feeling a little hungry now after some of the talk about bagels. <laughs> But um, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to all of our speakers and panelists for the time you took today to participate in the conversation. Hopefully, we were able to um, give you a few nuggets to adjust your trajectory through the day and the week ahead. Um, CCG's mission is to bring together 
great, great, bring great people together to do extraordinary things. So that really was part of our mission with this virtual forum and the series that we're going to continue to go forward with, bringing together our customers, our experts, and all of our attendees to have a conversation uh, and certainly these extraordinary times that we have right now um, and hopefully give you the opportunity to give and get information, uh, create contacts, which we can help you to do to connect you with some of the speakers today and, and create relationships to come together and do great things as we all embark on the recovery from, uh, from this, this uh, very extraordinary time. Uh, many of our speakers, as well as a lot of our other customers, are, are open to kind of forging new relationships. So for those attending today, if there's somebody you really wanted to try to get to know, have a sounding board, um, just you know, have a discussion with, reach out to us. Um, obviously, everyone's time is limited, but they're very open to doing that. Um, continuing that mission, uh, everyone that attended today is going to receive uh, in a follow-up email an invitation to schedule your own rapid recovery workshop. Um, so obviously there's a lot of information we shared today. Some folks ask questions, but we would definitely love to give you the opportunity to kind of have some tailored time with certainly some of our experts, but we could also um, bring in maybe a couple of the uh, customers that you heard from today uh, to have your own workshop to address your needs and help you put together your strategy and plan for having the right data analytics in place um, as we work together to move forward in recovery. Um, so please look forward to that. I encourage you to definitely send us all the information that you can think of, right? Questions, topics, anything critical to you um, so that we can tailor that time to be valuable for you and give you some, uh, some actionable things to, to walk away with. Um, we've also got a lot of things that we can kind of present when we have more time um, some different offerings and solutions for you to consider as you go forward on um, crisis scenario modeling, um, some ways to bring that customer information um, that's more forward looking into your to your realm and your purview so you can plan for that accordingly. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, the objective of these forums was to try to be innovative, a little experimental, mixing up panels with chats. Um, we definitely want to encourage participation. We'll continue to go uh, move forward with that, maybe have some open mic discussions as we proceed. Uh, definitely encourage you to register for day two, mix that up a little bit. It's a happy hour session on the afternoon on Friday um, and more of kind of a fireside chat um, type of approach with a variety of speakers coming with a, a variety of different angles, um, including kind of a private equity perspective and um, Microsoft expertise, things like that. Uh, so definitely encourage you to uh, register for that. Lastly, I welcome any feedback. Um, this, when, when you commit this amount of time, which we really appreciate, it's all about us trying to make sure you got value out of the day. Um, so please don't hesitate to send us any thoughts. It could be format, logistics, um, other topics you'd like to hear about, uh, you name it. So please feel free to do that. Um, obviously, we're all dealing with, uh, you know, a historical situation uh, right now. And, you know, for, for CCG, we take uh, very seriously our, our passion to help. Uh, you know, we're a data and analytics firm first and foremost, but we're, we're built and, and at, at core to our DNA is being a trusted advisor and a consultant and just someone who um, can sit with you and hash out whatever uh, problems or, or challenges you're looking to tackle. Um, so please, you know, know we're here, continue to uh, participate in these forums, reach out to me, any of the speakers today, um, anyone here at CCG, and um, we'll be happy to spend more time with you talking through whatever we can to help you um, as you continue to lead your company uh, in recovery. So I think we've got a few extra minutes here, but uh, I'm sure everybody is ready to get to their day. We really appreciate um, the time and definitely uh, thanks again to all of our speakers. Some great content and information. And um, unless Marianne has anything to say to wrap us up, I hope you all have a, a wonderful and productive rest of your day and week. And we look forward to seeing you in our next forum.